at some point I'll make a real intro. Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to the next round of episodes for Battleground Countdown. Uh, my name is Aaron Canole. Next to me, of course, is Mr. Austin Howell. We'll get to him in a second, though. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you to all of you who tuned into the initial set of episodes that we uploaded. Uh, originally, the plan had been for Matt and I to make this a sort of bi-weekly program, and then very quickly schedules made it clear that that was not going to be possible, and so we had to take some time off and sort of redevelop the idea um, and so obviously I put a post up on the Facebook page that goes into it more in detail, but the way we're going to be doing this now is every other month we're going to be uploading a series of episodes that will be focused on countdown topics related to just various movies that released in the intermediary period. So not everything's going to directly line up with when it came out, but just things that are in the discussion of film in general we'll be using for topics, uh, which I think will make it more fun because it also means there will be instances where the movie that we picked it for – we'll have a chance to see and maybe it'll be good enough to include on the list this is one of those examples uh as we'll get to later uh, of course also we're uploading this uh, or at least the plan is and i don't see why i shouldn't make it because there's no editing involved in this crap but a uh, new happy christmas eve guys i decided to start it on christmas eve because god knows i've done such a great job putting battleground content out there i thought i should put something out uh so we're uploading this on christmas eve martin scorsese austin is this a way you like to celebrate your christmas watching just all the bloodiest murders you can find oh man you know i think i actually oddly enough i might actually watch gangs in new york around christmas time every year but <laughs> i'm not even joking <laughs> i actually do actually, I can see it. I can well see just it. because it's got like you know it's got that winter vibe there's a lot of snow yeah. in that movie and stuff you know in certain points and uh yeah. you know it's got a wintry feel to it but uh yeah no i i, I love your die hard man. yeah <laughs> no definitely <laughs> i'll be talking about die hard later uh on a whole separate broadcast but yeah uh no i love scorsese man and uh he's definitely you know scorsese is one of those last few i think event directors who would probably agree that we all you know that gets that anticipation sort of like uh Tarantino or Christopher Nolan or some of those guys that are still, you yeah. know, making movies uh, where people, you know, it's a big deal as far as what he's going to do next and uh, when things come out and whatnot and all the speculation. So I would say Spielberg, but I think he's kind of lost his luster the last 10, 15 years, honestly, over his his movies, you know, and, and that kind of hype. But, you know, he's still one of the all timers. But, uh, yeah, I mean, looking on my list, I got a lot of movies here that are some all time greats for me, for sure. Yeah, absolutely, man. When he is on his game martin scorsese says he delivers uh, some of the best certainly most impactful films of all time i feel like mm -hmm. over the years you know we're going on 40 50 years of a career now he is yeah. uh, a director that people look to for inspiration for style for visual flair uh he is technically i feel like one of the best filmmakers of all time like even if emotionally you connect more to spielberg's films or you connect more to like the sci-fi stuff that he doesn't dive into or you connect more to i uh, i don't know how you're emotionally connecting to certain nolan films but maybe you connect to those yeah, films right. more scorsese technically is one of the best filmmakers of all time his films can be studied almost every single one of them i think in some way can be studied for some element of the filmmaking process um, right which is evident in the fact that when we did a scorsese a segment in my history of film class we legitimately did like six films because there's just so many you can oh yeah you can, you can pluck stuff from you can pluck editing from one you can pluck performance mm -hmm. and acting performance from another you can do a uh, score and voiceover from another one you could do yes. uh just like the good fellows the one shot through the restaurant you could study camera work and all that kind of stuff you know I mean, yeah he's he's done the best of the best as far as in every aspect of filmmaking and yeah he's one of those guys that is certainly in the conversation when people bring up the greatest of all time for sure yeah absolutely and of course we're doing this in honor of uh, killers of the flower moon now this was a topic i picked originally when we were set to have episodes come out in october when it released but a i still wanted to do it so we kept it and b the movies continue to remain relevant uh, not the box office didn't do that well but uh, that's kind of historical for Scorsese, right? I mean, the guy's kind of not known for always having the best box office track records. Um, but uh, in terms of the discussion of film, I feel like for the first time in a long time, Scorsese is a real contender at the Oscars this year for like a multi-award winning film. I mean, you know, best picture, best director, actor, actress, supporting actor. Uh, Robbie Robertson's score seems like it's more than likely going to get nominated. He's picking up those noms elsewhere. Um, you know, you look at the cinematography from Rodrigo Preto. Certainly, 
uh, this year. He's already picked up nominations for Barbie and for this. If you only pick one, it has to be Kill as a Flower Girl. I'm sorry, okay. Barbie, great, but the guy should win for that. Um, yeah, like it's a real contender, and I feel like he hasn't had that in a long time because I feel like the last time people talked about a film like this for him was probably Wolf of Wall Street, but even then didn't only get like five noms or something. Like it yeah, was- it didn't get as many as you thought. And yeah, it didn't end up winning much, if anything, no. right? From what I can remember. And then before that, obviously it was The Departed. So, you know, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it hasn't really been a lot. Was Gangs of New York the last time he played Gangs of like, New York? Digits? Gangs in New York, um, yeah, got a lot of nominations, but again, didn't really win didn't much. Win, I think no. he only picked up, like, he might have picked up one or two for that. I can't remember exactly. But, yeah, another one where he doesn't – he's not one of those guys that makes movies that, like, sweep the Oscars or anything like that. Um, you know, I don't know if he's ever made one quite like that because even stuff like – Raging Bull lost out for Best Picture, you know. Uh, you know, some of his movies that are more acclaimed, Goodfellas famously lost to Dancing with the Wolves, <laughs> uh, you know. So some of those ones that you, you look back on and you go like, yeah, maybe that was the wrong call, you know. Hindsight's twenty twenty, But, uh, yeah, I, I, I feel like he still makes those movies that – when you look at him, yeah, it's more of a surprise of like, how did that not win? That was clearly the better movie, but at the time, maybe it's like, you know, the Oscar baby yeah. stuff is what gets what, him in the short, short term. What, what's even funnier than than Goodfellas losing to Dances with Wolves is not actually comparing the quality of Goodfellas to Dances yeah. with Wolves. It's comparing the films they've inspired in the year since, and you just yeah. go, wow, really? That's the okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That was the best picture that year. Okay. <laughs> right. So yeah, it happens. But I think again, history has kind of been on his side with some of these movies, and yes. it, it, yes. and we were talking, you know, before we even live about you've taken film classes and how his movies are literally studied, and you can do a whole semester on Martin Scorsese, yeah. and certain schools do, and and you know, yeah. we're not doing we're not doing a, semesters on Kevin Costner directed movies, you know, or you, you, could, <laughs> you know, you things could like probably that. teach an entire editing course just off of. Thelma uh, Schoon, Schoonmaker, is that how you say her name? Something like that, yeah. Schoonmaker yeah, you could teach a whole class is, yeah. off of just her work. Right. Um, just not not the snowman, not that one, but the rest of her work. You could, <laughs> sure. you when could, she works with the right person, yes. <laughs> yeah. When she's editing a good movie. She right, with a good director and a good movie, yes. <laughs> uh, she can do great work. No, so, yeah, Martin Scorsese is the topic tonight. Uh, of course, we both have our top 11s. I'm very curious as to how this is going to go. Uh, I, I'm certainly, uh, I saw like all of his 2010s movies pretty much as they were coming out. Because I was a kid when Hugo would have come out. Wolf of Wall Street, I watched at a very inappropriate age. By the time he rolled around to silence, it was like, oh, yeah. I the story okay. about a weird watching of the Wolf of Wall Street when we get there, I'll talk about it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, I, I've seen a lot of his, I've seen all of his recent films as they were coming. Um, but there was, aside from like the film school stuff, there was a lot of his older stuff that I was not familiar with. And so this was a great excuse to go back and get to see it for the first time and really, really get a better, fuller sense of who he is as a director. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to get into it. So, uh, the way that this works, uh, we both have separate top 11 lists. Why do we do a top 11? Because it's different than a top 10 and it's not quite a top 12. Shout out to Malcolm. Uh, so we go with 11. Why not? Uh, Austin's going to do his as the guest host here. He's going to do his 11 through eight first. I'll do my 11 through eight. He'll do his seven through four. I'll do my seven through four for our top three. We will trade back and forth one apiece. I'll be keeping notes throughout the show. Uh, at which point, once we have the list together, we can finalize the show's lists. Um, with that said, uh, if a, a person brings up a film that is in a separate section of the list, all they will have to do is say punt, and we will wait till we reach the uh, next spot. So that is to say, if your 11 is my 8, we can go ahead and talk about it there. But if my 11 is your 7, we'll wait till we get to your 7 to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, with that said, though, do you have any final notes? Or are we ready to jump into it? No, uh, you know, I was just going to say that's one one thing we talked about again before we went live is my number 11 spot. I won't get into it just just yet, but, uh, you know, I think my number 11 spot, we both agree on this, was I had about three or four contenders, you know, that could have gone yeah. to this number 11 spot. All movies I really like, but not quite that top 10 level. Um, but, you know, so I, I just kind of went with one a few days ago and uh, we'll just see what happens. But my top 10 is pretty much my top 10, like pretty solidly. Uh, but we'll get into it. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's totally fair. Uh, 
So yeah, uh, so we'll go ahead and get it going then. Uh, Austin, if you want to go ahead and get started, what mm -hmm. is your number 11? My start? number 11 is The Last Temptation of Christ. Of all the ones we discussed, that is the one I did not get to, so go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, this was actually a first-time watch uh, this past year, and uh, I, I ended. Up, I bought the Criterion a while back when it was on sale, and it was one that I'd been meaning to get to, so this kind of gave me a, uh, a reason to, and I was also just kind of, I, over this last year, I've been filling in my Scorsese gaps anyway, so this is a happy coincidence that you asked me to do the show, um, you know, because it's, it's a project I've been working on anyways. I, uh, I don't know why, but you struck me as the kind of guy who would know something about Scorsese. Yeah, I mean, no. Uh, I, 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 had, I didn't have to watch much like for this show. I really only had like two gaps I had to fill in anyways. And I bet I plan on doing it regardless just in 2023. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I was a perfect guy where I already had like a solid top 10. It's just fill in some of those other things. Uh, but yeah, you know, this is one that uh, I had heard about for a long time. I'd heard about the controversies and whatnot back in the day uh, when it was initially released. Of course, anything with religious connotations is going to get, you know, uh, controversy from the Catholic Church and whatnot, you know, different religious groups. Uh, but realistically, there's not there, – if the people had actually seen the movie, which most of the cases they haven't actually watched the movie, uh, but if they had actually seen the movie, they would know it's really more like a what-if kind of movie. And what I mean by that is it's really just Martin Scorsese's uh, take on Jesus as a person from like the human aspect of him being a human being uh, and what it would be like if um, you know he kind of has the same buildup where he goes through the same stories where he's tempted in the desert, where he's uh, performing some of the miracles and whatnot and the sermons and everything, uh, but where he takes the turn and kind of the premise is he takes the tact of him getting tempted on the cross uh, to, to have live a life beyond being sacrificed. So essentially, what if he didn't die on the cross? What if instead he he was he came back down and lived a full life as a human being with a family, with a wife, with children, all that kind of stuff? And it shows you most of that. It's like an alternate history kind of thing. And that's what I thought was really fascinating is it takes the Jesus character on what he might feel his feelings towards you know, his human feelings towards, uh, you know, nobody wants to die and go through, you know, a big thing of, of suffering and whatnot. And then he's a guy and, and has these human feelings of wanting a family and, uh, you know, wanting to just uh, be a person. And it like it, it takes this like tact where right as it does that and then pivots and shows you like his entire life of what it would have been like had he not uh, sacrificed himself, you know, on the cross and whatnot. It's really, really interesting and really fascinating. Um, and, and I really, really enjoyed kind of his take on this. It's based on a um, uh, guy's book. I think his name is like Neo Kasazakis or something like that. I can't remember his exact name. Um, but yeah, uh, Kasazakis, I think is his last name. I'm pretty certain about that. It's like Nico or something like that. Um, but yeah, it, it's based on a book and, and all it is is kind of a what if scenario essentially uh, that I found really, really interesting. It's really well shot. Willem Dafoe, uh, plays Jesus and he gives a really kind of uh, interesting nuanced performance as him, you know, different than, you know, your typical Jim Caviezel or something like that, more of a straightforward <laughs> sort of Jesus, you know, I mean, it's very, it's very Willem Dafoe, uh, but you know, it's, it's very good in that aspect. He really carries it well. And uh, I think it's a really, really interesting movie. If you haven't seen it, uh, give it a shot. It's not a movie that I'll go back to and watch like over and over again. Uh, but again, it's a movie that I think is, it, it, once it gets in your brain, it'll stick with you for a little while. So yeah, my number 11 is uh, Last Temptation. Yeah, so yeah, the book, The Last Temptation of Christ by Nikos Kazantzakis. Kazantzakis, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to assume I said that somewhat right. Uh, I remember when I first, uh, when I heard about this film, because uh, this was one of those movies that was like, when I, co when I covered him years ago in like film history class, Scorsese, we sort of touched on most of what he made, and then we watched a handful of them. Mm -hmm. This was one of the ones that was like touched on, and I just remember like looking it up and being like, it wasn't even like, Obviously, Defoe is Jesus is just an interesting idea. Right. And obviously, this is not the Defoe we know now. This is a Defoe 30 years ago. Right. What interested me even more is David Bowie is Pontius Pilate, which I don't even know yeah. how much he's in the movie. But he's not so He's weird. not in the movie that much. He maybe has like 10 minutes of screen time. It's really not that much. He has a couple of scenes with Defoe, and that's really it. Like, he's not – there's a lot of big names that pop up throughout the movie, but they're only yeah. in it like a little bit, you know, here and there. Uh, so, but, yeah, he's, he's interesting for what it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, David yeah. Bowie. Bowie's like, Bowie, hey, Bowie's a solid actor, man. Like, if you go back like, and lose Bowie, Bowie yeah. turns in every time I watch a Bowie film. I remember the first time I watched uh, The Prestige, right? That's yeah, the one yeah. he's in of those two. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, the first time I watched he's, The Prestige. Tesla. Yeah. He's great in that film, is Tesla. Right. Every time I see his name on a cast list, all I can think is Labyrinth. Even though he is a better actor than that movie would lead you to believe, and he's not bad in it by any means, but every time I see his name on the cast list, I just yeah. think 
that man with the with the cod piece and like the rotating balls, and I just think that guy's in a Scorsese movie. That is fucking funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. But no, it, it's a really intriguing. I, I always find like what if history stories to be really intriguing. Um, yeah. And this is obviously it's it's a very very intriguing one and totally understandable uh why people would revolt to it at the time. <laughs> yeah, but if they see that like it then cuts back to like him not doing that. You know what I mean? And yeah, like yeah, he yeah. goes through with it. It's more like a it's like a diversion in his head, but it's fully fleshed out the where you see it happen, um, you know, fully fleshed out. But then it like cuts back to him on the cross and he actually does it. You know what I mean? Like it's it's just it's just a what if scenario and he's just taking him it's as like a, a human. Yeah. It's like this is a weird comparison, but it's like a it's like a family guy cutaway if it went on for three hours. Yeah, if it went on for a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, and even that section of the movie, like where it does the what if thing and the pivot, it's it's like 45 minutes, you know what I mean? And then it cuts yeah, back. Okay. So yeah, I mean we still see most of the regular kind of stuff about Jesus' story, life until yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the first like hour and a half or so, and then it pivots to that. So uh but that's the most intriguing stuff in the movie. But I, I dig it, man. It, yeah, it, man. It, it, it's a good watch. It, it was one of the ones, like, when it came to the stuff I hadn't seen, I just tried to go off of what I've heard is great. And it, mm-hmm. this one came down to the end of, like, if I can squeeze more in, right. let me put this in. Runtime is killer, man. I could fit, like... I know, yeah. <laughs> I could only fit one long one in at the end. It was like, I picked a different one. Uh, so... You need like yeah. you need like horror topics because a lot of horror movies are like ninety minutes. You can bounce a bunch in and out, you know, in a day. That's <laughs> like, true. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, That's like Scorsese movies are not. One are of not, the episodes, yeah. one of the episodes we have coming up, it'll actually be the next one that goes up, is our Disney episode with Jacob Barber. So oh, there you go. Oh, 80, minutes, 80, minutes, eighty minutes, eighty-five minutes, ninety minutes. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah, you're good. Exactly. I I, I solidified like we have not recorded that episode at the time of recording this. Uh, I have basically solidified my top 11. Like it's been three films since I've seen a movie. That's like, that'll be, I can still watch more. Cause they're just oh, so sure. Yeah, you yeah. Can just oh yeah. Them them out. Out. Like, why not? Oh yeah. Uh, so what's your number 10, man? We'll move on. My number 10 is uh, his remake of Cape fear. Okay. Not on my list. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, if you haven't seen this, this is really, really good. And uh, one of the cases where I think, uh, uh, you know, remake can, can do something really solid, especially in the hands of Scorsese. And a lot of people may not even realize that he directed uh, this movie or may not even be that aware of it. Um, Cause you know, it gets talked about in certain circles, but um, you know, I think a lot of people are aware of the, uh, you know, the original Gregory Peck, like Robert Mitchell one and, uh, and not aware of this one. Obviously it's Robert De Niro is in there, you know, no surprise there. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's this guy, uh, you know, you know, back in the day, it was De Niro and now it's and now it's uh, DiCaprio you know so it is what it is uh but he does this thing yeah it's got uh Nick Nolte uh Jessica Lange uh, a bevy just a huge bevy of character actors all sprinkled throughout the movie that he uses really well even Joe Don Baker who plays like a decent part in the movie is like a guy that Nick Nolte hires to beat the shit out of Robert De Niro at one point basically to get him out of his life uh but yeah what carries it is definitely uh, De Niro doing like this really kind of uh, heavy Southern accent, uh, but he's very, very creepy. So even if you haven't seen the movie, you might have seen like the little meme or the little clip of him in a movie theater smoking a cigar, just laughing inappropriately at the movie that's on the screen. Uh, that's from this movie uh, where he's just laugh, <laughs> you know, just just going nuts in the theater and everybody getting mad at him. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's the same basic story. It's it's uh, De Niro gets out of jail. Um, and you know, has a kind of a vendetta against his lawyer who Nick Nolte played that it felt like he didn't, you know, defend him properly. And then all just he wants to do is just give him some money and get out of his, out of his life. And he kind of makes uh, Nolte's life a living hell <laughs> throughout the rest of the movie, getting to very dangerous portions. Um, but yeah, I, I think Scorsese puts a real sense of dread onto it. Uh, you know, it's edited really well, it moves along at a great pace. It's not one of his longer movies, I think it's like two hours or just a little over two hours, so it's yeah. not that hard to watch. Um, but yeah. I, I, you know, I think it's worth it just for the De Niro performance. Um, some people have criticized the last 20, 30 minutes as it gets to like almost horror movie on this like houseboat with him almost being like a, you know, horror movie serial killer or something like that. But at the same time, I think the movie has kind of earned the escalation that it does. So I kind of disagree uh, with that. Um, but it builds really, really nicely. And I think there's a nice atmosphere to it and, uh, you know, a nice tension to it. So, uh, yeah, it's just a movie I really recommend. And I've gone back to every couple of years and watched. And I think it's, it's kind of overlooked for his filmography and a lot of people kind of forget about him. So I wanted to shout out uh, Kate Fear. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, this is this is one of the ones I haven't seen. Uh, I think I just kind of, I I've always heard it like if someone had to describe it offhand on a line, I've always heard it described as like 
Scorsese's horror film kind yeah, of. Yeah, it's the like, closest thing he's done to a horror movie closest. for sure. Um, yeah. And I think mentally, I was just like, it's like, okay, if I see everything else I want to see, I'll come back to it. But I kind of just wrote it off because one of the ones I had seen is Shutter Island, and I'm mm. actually not a fan of Shutter Island. Mm. So I was just like, uh, all right, I want to go see the other horror ish film and hit now, see the others. And yeah. it's like, but I, listen, yeah. I've also heard great acclaim for it. It had multiple nominations, right? It had like acting nominations. Man, I I want to say, yeah, that's one that I didn't really look up before we went live, but it might have, you was know. It, was it Jessica, Jessica Lang, right? Then yeah, I, I think she, she got was. one. Yeah, yeah. She's very good in it. Yeah, she she has some scenes uh, back and forth in the that are really good um, where she's so, kind of yeah. pleading with him to, you know, leave them alone. Yeah, nominated for two so yeah oh no de niro was nominated and uh no julia lewis was nominated for support julia she, lewis was she plays the daughter yeah so she's very mm -hmm. good um yeah she has some kind of uncomfortable scenes with de niro with de niro's like kind of you know awkwardly hitting on her and whatnot things like that she's kind of intrigued with him because he's why, like a bad boy why, <laughs> but yeah why why is de niro hitting that. on women that's too young for him a thing in the scorsese film it it's just is him. i don't know you know he's he's an inappropriate weird dude <laughs> but you know <laughs> plays those but that, hey that's one thing we'll talk about though with scorsese he's not afraid to dive into like very no. you know gray area scummy characters yeah, you know and he just throws you into their world and lets you see their perspective on things mm -hmm. and i think that's one thing that sets him apart is, is he's not afraid to do that and there's a lot of filmmakers who are afraid to kind of dive in head first onto really scummy people and just just drop you in and say look this is who they are they may or may not have a redemption <laughs> they may not have a redemption so a lot of them don't <laughs> uh, in yeah, his movies you know they're just bad people and yeah in real life there are bad people who don't have you know a redeeming uh movie story on Line, you know where they do good things they're just always really shitty people uh and it happens so uh yeah that's one thing i like about scorsese he's not afraid to get uh get down into the dirty <laughs> and i like it so yeah uh, Cape Fear, number nine, sir? Well, uh, my number nine is the departed uh, that is a punt punts all right sounds good uh, i figured i i'm i really really like it i'm just not as high on it as the rest of this film community seems to be <laughs> as far as well like, i, I like believe i mean we ever. talked obviously a little bit before we yeah, yeah i truly believe when you say your top 10 is your top 10 yes of all these it is just well, for movie. sure yeah it's just awesome. a ranking so uh and my number eight is taxi driver is that a punt that is yes that is a punt okay cool so yeah it is taxi driver fair enough all right so with that, we'll go ahead then and then move over uh, to mine. Um, yeah, this is going to be interesting uh, for me, I think. Uh, so these bottom three. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's funny is originally my number 11 was a film and it was a similar thing to Austin where it's like there's like four films that were vying for the spot and I went with this right. one. The more that I've thought about it, just since we started recording, I've bumped that up to number eight. And it's for a particular reason, because I think okay. my 11 through nine all have a similar issue. And it's why I put them at the bottom of this list. Uh, so we'll start with my number 11, which is The Irishman. OK, it's not on my list. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so th this movie is, for starters, I do think it's, it's a really, really uh, well-made movie. Um, it also features probably one of the few technical flaws in Scorsese's career, which is the mocap work with De Niro. It's just not convincing. Like, there's just no way around. Well, it. It, it, there's weird stuff like when he's like kicking the guy outside. Yeah. It, it's like he's supposed to be like thirty year old, you know, De Niro, De Niro but, he's but he much. but he moves around like eighty year old De Niro, and you could tell in the mocap that he's moving like that. Like you know, even when they stand up out of a chair, it's not a young person standing up out of the chair; yeah. it's an old person doing it. And yeah, I think that's a little bit of a mistake. I, I wish they so, would just. Re casted somebody to do the young parts honestly yeah, you, you should have yeah. got different actors um but for me the the irishman is is a case of the ensemble in this film lifts what i think could have slipped into being one of the more mediocre films of his career i mm. think de niro is good but i remember there being a lot of sort of discussion around the fact that pesci and pacino were nominated but de niro wasn't and i actually i think we agreed i think pacino's better than de niro and i think pesci's better than de niro in both yes. that movie i i, I agree pesci, with the academy pesci's on that excellent one. I, I love Pesci in this movie. He takes on the the kind of the, the almost the Don role very yeah. well in this. Uh, and Pacino's great as Hoffa. Um, a, a whole bunch of like I remember uh, seeing like like Ray Romano has like a part as one of the gangsters in this, and like not someone you would expect to show up in this movie, but he's yeah. very good in his role. Uh, Anna Paquin has a small role as his daughter. She doesn't even get to say very much, if much at all, and mm -hmm. she's excellent. Just her performance, her acting is so strong. 
Um, it's the ensemble keeps you interested. I think in terms of story, this is probably his least interesting gangster film. Mm. Um, but I think the performances and, and the runtime is just far too long, which is the issue I have with all three of these films at the end. The runtime does kill your interest a little bit. Um, but the ensemble within this film raises it to the number 11 above some of the others where it's like there's one or two actors in particular that stand out for me and the rest is good. This is like, okay, De Niro's not at his best, but everyone else is excellent. So it raises, I would go back for the performances in this before some of the others that wound up here. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's the runtime thing is interesting because I think there's a few movies where it, earlier he did this really well, and I think his last couple um, just don't have that third act sense of urgency to me. And I think that you know, there's a, his best movies I think have like a quickening of like the tension, and yeah, a set of like where you feel like walls are closing in, you know, and like something yes. is coming down on our main characters, you know, and there's escalation. And I feel like The Irishman, and I, you know, I don't know if you have Killers of Flower Moon, that was one of my issues with that. Like, I think it's a good movie but i don't feel that sense of like walls closing in you know near the end of it uh when i'm watching it and i think that's a problem to where i think if you had trimmed a few things here and there and kind of quickened that third act pace you know and and really escalated things quickly i think you'd have a much stronger finale <laughs> yeah so i'm with you i think the irish is really good it's just not yeah it's not one that would crack mine either because of the same kind of similar reasons yeah that's fair it this is just it's the performances for me overall raise yeah. it above some of the others that i think are good but are missing that bit of great hey and a good scorsese movie is still better than a lot of other people's movies so you know what i'm That's fine true. with that <laughs> yeah like if while this movie and i think this movie also like it, it, it's one of those uh films i think it suffers from the fact that scorsese almost does have the gangster film down to such a formula that it does start to feel a little repetitive at points but it's because he's just so good at what he does that yeah you're like in the best way possible you're like oh, i've seen this before and you can't help but compare but i think if you separate it on its own it right. is i mean it's still almost damn near impeccably made oh yeah uh, sure. so with that said uh, my number 10 is a film that i i think very few people would have in their top 10 uh but i've loved it since the moment i saw it in fact i've seen it multiple times uh silence okay no i don't i watched it this year but uh it that one's one where i, I think I don't know. I couldn't get into it. I just, I just couldn't yeah, get into it. I, honestly, yeah, yeah. I can't even fully explain what it is because I see the criticisms. I see the issues that people have with it, but something about it uh, just like it almost feels surreal. And to an extent, it is a little uh, surreal at points. Not that it's it's literally surreal, but like uh, for, for example, one of my favorite things of all time is is the the four. Uh, four of the five actual characters in this are Spanish Jesuit priests right. and they're played by Andrew Garfield, Adam Driver, Liam Neeson, and Kieran Hines, which is some of the most right. ridiculous casting you will ever get. <laughs> but all four of these guys are legitimately great performers. And even if they are not necessarily a fit for this, they are bringing their most to it. Specifically Garfield and Driver, I think were the perfect, like they are the perfect type of young, hungry actor to take a leading role at this point in their career for a director like Scorsese to push themselves as actors to deliver the amount of emotion that is needed out of this performance. Um, and I think that is, it is, uh, and again, it has some of the same issues as his more recent films. And if it's a trend, we'll get to the other one in a second. The runtime is a little long, uh, it certainly, and I, there's moments where it does just sort of take you out of it, but it's a unique film in his filmography, uh, studying these, you know, following the story of these priests. Um, and I think the performances are strong enough. The cinematography is beautiful in this movie. It is so good. I was going to mention Rodrigo Prito. Yeah, well, no matter what you think of the movie, I was watching it on Blu-ray on my big uh, 4K TV. Oh, yeah. And like, holy hell, this movie was beautifully shot. I, if anything else, yeah, I was admiring, yeah, how gorgeous Lisa How gorgeous it shot. is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, 100%. Yeah, I mean, and this was this was the first Scorsese film I would have seen in theaters. Right. Um, And like, definitely you appreciate like how well this is made when you're looking at it on a big screen um and so yeah I, I think it's just and maybe that's part of it it is the first one i saw in a theater so maybe there's just a part of like cinema mm -hmm. love for that this is the first one i got to experience uh <laughs> unfortunately so i saw it in an empty theater that's not much of a <laughs> shock doing how this film right. did uh, but it, it was a lot of fun. Oh, that's not the right word. It was an incredible experience to kind of see this type of filmmaking 
on the big screen. And I think it's made me appreciate it in some subsequent viewings. And maybe there's a tie to a memory there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why it's hard to explain because I do get the criticisms against it. But I've always enjoyed it. Um, and especially because I do think a lot of his work can be formulated into one of like two or three columns. I appreciate the stuff that stands out on its own. Yeah, no, I have one in my top three that's very personal that I don't know if a lot of other people have in their top three, but I'll kind of explain it when I get there, like why I love it. Yeah, um, yeah and I kind of have a similar thing. It's the first one I saw in theaters. <laughs> I've seen pretty okay. much all his movies in theaters for the last 20 years or so. Um, other than Silent Silence was the one I missed, uh, but I have it on Blu-ray. But uh, yeah, that yeah. was the only one. But every other one I've seen in theaters since then, even The Irishman, I was able to see in the theater. So, um, but yeah, like I, I, yeah, it's always it's always something. But yeah, we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> Yeah, so then I, I, I've made reference to it, so I'll just go to it. Surprise, surprise. My number nine is Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, so I, I did I did really enjoy this movie. I enjoyed it more than his last two, obviously. It's here. Um, I do think it suffers from the same runtime issues. And, and I think you brought it up, which is great. It's not just runtime issue. It is pacing issue. It yes. feels like, as it, like there is a bit of that edge to his filmmaking that may have been lost with age. He wouldn't be the first director to have that happen to him. And he's yeah. still a very good filmmaker for his age. Uh, but you're right. There is like, for, especially for this movie, for the story that it's telling, there should be more urgency. I feel like as you start yeah. to reach the concluding point. And I think because of the type of story it is compared to the others, yeah. like Silence and the Irishman, there is naturally that momentum there, but it's not there as much as it would have been if he had made this 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, again, the performances in this are excellent. Lily Gladstone's really great. Robert De Niro is the best I've seen him. In it's it's his best in ten years at least. Uh, he's he's, like, he is yeah, so he's great. He's great. He steals uh, as in. the king. Yes. Um, and this isn't an unpopular opinion. In fact, it's probably the popular opinion. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Jesse Clemens are both excellent in this movie. They mm -hmm. should have switched roles. Maybe, yeah, that might have I, I been think, interesting. Because like, I think Leo, and it's funny because my next film, uh, I also have an issue uh, with casting from a Leonardo DiCaprio character. At this point in his career, Leo almost looks too smart to play a character this dumb. Like there's something <laughs> about him that just doesn't quite fit this character. Whereas yeah. in the most complimentative way possible, Jesse Plemons has played this character before, and I think he would have nailed it even further in this yeah, film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Whereas I think Leo definitely could play the agent. Like he definitely strikes me as the kind of guy who could walk into the situation and be like, all right, come on. You're not really pulling one over on us here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and to be fair, Plemons is strong enough to play both roles, but I think he would have suited Leo's more role role more. And I think Leo certainly would have suited the agent role more. Um, but I also think you have to give credit to a lot of the native actors uh, who are in this film, filling in all the various different roles. Uh, I think all of them, you know, obviously just by the nature of how many roles for native actors there are in Hollywood, a lot of these people have not worked on a film of this size or this magnitude before. And I think they're all brilliant in their supporting performances. Uh, and I think the movie does a great job at making you feel the emotion. All right. Mm -hmm. And while I do understand the criticism that some people have levied that maybe similar to like when Spielberg made the color purple, like maybe he's not the right person to make this movie. Mm -hmm. I can see it to a degree. But I also feel like when he learned this story, there was a part of his heart that ached for them, and he does put that on screen. Well, you have to also take into effect that stories like this on this scale might not be made unless there was a director like no, this attached and to you're it. you're correct. So back back in 85, when Spielberg did Color Purple, that kind of story may not have been put to screen had somebody like as big as Spielberg not lobby for it. And I don't think he initially wanted to at the time. I think he wanted somebody else, but he kind of got pushed into doing it. Um, yeah. But this one, yeah, this story may not have may have just been swept under and, and you know passed over uh, had Scorsese not been passionate about it. And maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't know enough about the behind the scenes, but um, yeah. Well, I mean, he, 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 he molded on this for a long Long time he purchased right. the rights to two different books because this was the second book yeah he like he had had rights to another book and then never got to make the movie and then he purchased the rights to this one and did it so this has definitely been on i mean that's i feel like the norm for scorsese now it feels like he's just going back and doing all the things he never got to do so yeah. cool. well i mean and you know this is definitely the big when you look at i think it had like a hundred million dollar budget or something like that something which is like ridiculous. which is like the biggest budget he's ever had you know for any one of his movies uh yeah i mean so uh you know he's making a pretty 
you know, epic scale movie. And there are definitely stuff in there where he's, he's building whole towns. I mean, he's got immense amounts of extras and a lot of scenes. I mean, you, you definitely do live in this world. I think most the thing is he, he's always able to throw you into a world, you know, and, and you're yeah. very much absorbed in it, which yeah, is what I like. But yeah, I like your idea that maybe had they switched those roles, maybe have Leo, yes, yeah, show up halfway through the movie instead of at the beginning, that would have been kind of yeah. cool. And a nice change of pace where it's like, Hey, where's Leo? Oh, there he is. And he kind of elevates. And, but then he, yeah, like you said, but that would, elevate the movie and like Ed, you know the tension comes in you go oh okay here's leo to, to kind of bump the movie up a little bit and you know, i think shows up at the door I, like now that i'm thinking about it more analytic like i think leo also has the intensity to maybe bring some of what might be mm -hmm. missed in plemons performance right like, i think they both play the role that they have serviceably but something in me mm -hmm. feels like if they had switched yeah. their natural instincts would have played more into the other role better yeah, no, I'm I'm not opposed to that. So it's it's interesting, <laughs> alternate universe kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what if? Yeah. But, or James uh, Corsese has he another hundred million at home. Go make the same again. movie again. <laughs> just re-edit the movie and just refilm those scenes, and yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. But no, no, I like the movie. Um, yeah, it's not one of my favorites of 2023 or anything like that. Um, I do think it's very good though. I, I enjoyed it for what it is. I'd be interested to give it a year or so and go back and rewatch it, and you know, see mm -hmm. if I reevaluate it at all. Um, but yeah, that was really my only issue. Is I, I just, you know, by the time the third act and the ending kind of rolled around, I was like, I just didn't feel the same tension I feel with some of his. Yeah, That's final true. third acts that you know he's been able to do in past movies where you feel like it's really like you know going full steam and you know you feel like the characters under the under the gun and like you know uh, getting paranoid and why we'll talk about it with some of his best movies where you feel like yeah there's there's a panic or something you know and you know things are really going on I just didn't feel that with this movie um, but it is what it's still very good again very good movie <laughs> I, I don't I don't have too many qualms with it yeah. Uh, so we'll go ahead then and go to my number eight, which this is the yep. one. Uh, so this is uh, both of the last two movies I watched uh, made it onto the list. Uh, I, I don't know why I saved two of the, the better ones I'd heard of till the end, but they, I watched two today. They made it on the list. Mm -hmm. uh, this one didn't connect with me fully, but I, it doesn't have the same issues exactly that I think these three films have, which is why I bumped it up. And I think it's a film that'll grow on me. Uh, when I give it a rewatch, and I, I do plan on watching it a, a second time at the very least, uh, and that is Gangs of New York. Put that for later. Yeah, I kind of figured based on the early discussion. But, right. <laughs> yeah. So that is my number. Yeah, but I like it so far. We got pretty different lists so far. I'm digging this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because nice. yeah. I, yeah. I imagine the crossover, the higher it goes. So. I like oh yeah, no, I'm sure we'll have at least a few crossovers later. But uh, I like this initially, so we're covering a lot of ground. Yeah. So go ahead, man. What's your number seven? My number seven is After Hours. That is my number seven as well. Hey, there we go. Now we finally got a crossover. <laughs> so let's, there we go. Let's, let's talk about some After Hours. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, no, this is great. Uh, yeah, this is a movie I first came to probably two or three years ago. I ended up uh, buying it on Voodoo and checking it out, and it's one that I've always heard of. I really like the kind of uh, sub sub genre in movies of the one crazy night sort of thing, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the one escalating problem after another <laughs> sort of one crazy night. And I like how kind of simple this movie is. It's just a guy trying to get home and go to sleep. And how many, and how how relatable is that, Aaron? With so many times where you're just in a situation, and for God's sakes, all you want to do is go home and go to bed. <laughs> That's literally all of Griffin Dunn's issue is, uh, you know, he thinks he's going to have one uh, a night that goes one way, it doesn't, and you know, all he wants to do is. It's just, it's just trap, you know, try to get home and uh, end this night and it just keeps going and going and going. And it's one of those situations. Yeah. He, you know, it's, it's one, this one problem. And then this next problem, he runs into this wacky character and this wacky character and this crazy personality gets mixed up in a bigger thing. And I don't even want to spoil too much of it because I feel this, this movie's kind of underseen uh, still over the years oh, and one of his lesser known ones. And I know it's, it's starting to get some momentum now that a uh, criterion has put it out. I think it showed up on max pretty recently. Um, so, you know, people can see it now, but for a long time it was very hard to find and uh yeah i just i, I really love uh especially yeah the performance of griffin dunn at the beginning who if you don't you know he's not uh, a super recognizable actor but he was in american werewolf in london which a lot of horror fans know him from um that's so, where i knew him from yeah okay. that's what most yeah. people know that's what most people know him from but yeah this is kind of his it's, other sort of famous role the person who will will spend a movie being like, yeah. where do I know this person from? And then I won't yeah. always look it up. That's yep. Okay. Yeah, he's the buddy in uh in uh, American Wolf in London. Um okay. but yeah, yeah, he's he's in there. Uh but yeah, I mean the basic premise is he meets a girl who kind of intrigues him, says, you know, 
she makes like paperweights or whatnot and she seems very quirky and fun you know and and they they kind of go to have a, a date uh but he's going he's got to go downtown you know it starts the problems with him his money flying out the window of the taxi cab and then uh her not being kind of quite the girl <laughs> he thought she was going to be and having some interesting issues <laughs> you know uh with her personality and some backstory and some boyfriends and husbands and whatnot uh just just not the quite the person, and I think again we've all been there. Where maybe this person sounds good, and then you start to dig, and you're like, "Yeah, no, I got to get out of here," <laughs> and uh, it's not going to work <laughs> out. But that's where the problems start because then it's raining, and then it's like then he he doesn't have enough money for the subway fare. You know, a whole thing. It just if, keeps going and going and going. If this uh, movie were made today, he would go. He would go to her apartment. He would have this date, and uh, then he'd be like texting his friend, like, "Hey, in five minutes, call me. There's a big right. emergency." But again, this is in a time period where you know there's no cell phones. You know, <laughs> and and, yeah, yeah. and and he has to even think about every time he puts a quarter in a payphone because that's his you know that's the only money he has it's like a dollar fifty in his pocket uh, you know because he lost his twenty dollar bill uh but you know it's it's little things that you have to put yourself in the context of the movie but it is what yeah. it is uh but I think the the center performance of Griffin Dunn you feel his his exhaustion you feel his tiredness like it looks even in his face like the way they do his makeup and whatnot i think yes. the actor even uh at certain points was staying up for like 24 hours at a time to get that sort of manic energy and like those yeah, eyes so and everything is, uh one of the great things about renting uh movies on amazon because that's how i watched this i rented it through amazon the x-ray thing uh is the fun fact thing that right, yeah, like yeah. you can see on on your phone and it was like apparently there was like a bonus in his contract where if he would forego sleep, uh, he would he would sl sleep to a lesser extent during the production of the film and forego sex. Ah, I see. Uh, <laughs> to like just naturally create this like appearance, like a frustration, yeah, and this yeah, appearance, yeah, yeah no, and, and you feel it in his performance. Like you're right there with him, and the way Scorsese, um, yeah, edits the movie and and you know how he directs him, yeah, you definitely feel like his frustration just escalate, you know, throughout the movie, and you're totally with him uh, in his kind of journey, just to again get home and get get back uptown and go to bed. That's all he wants to do before he has to work the next day, <laughs> and it just keeps getting later and later and later. Uh, but yeah, again, he peppers the movie with a lot of great uh sort of character actors uh yeah, John, John. I, I was gonna no, I, was I, gonna say, he, I, I pulled it up like yeah it, it's filled with a bunch of people that like you know like you know uh -huh. their face and then when you look them up you're like oh like fuck okay yeah because it's it's like you have here it is uh Rosanna Arquette Cheech and Chong Linda uh -huh. Fiorentino Terry Gar uh, the Home Alone parents, John Hurt, John Hurt and Catherine O'Hara are both in this movie. One's a bartender and one's a... Uh, even the smaller thing. roles, like Will Patton, Bronson uh, Pinchot, is that you say? Bronson saying? Pinchot from Beverly Hills Cop and all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. this movie is just Martin Scorsese in the funniest cameo of the various right. cameos I saw holding the spotlight at the sex oh, club. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, he always puts himself in there if he, if he listens. Well, mostly in voiceovers on the phone or something like that, but not this time. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. but yeah, he, he peppers it. Just all these wacky characters he's encountering and kind uh, in New York City, it's a great New York City movie because you just feel, uh, yeah, all that location. He uses locations really well here. I was gonna say, um, I, I, I don't know if the movie's on your list because we're speaking about Scorsese cameos right now. Aside from this one, the one that probably made me laugh the most because he gets more prolonged speaking time is uh, bringing out the dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, he's on the, the radio like the whole time. The, the, uh, yeah, the switchboard person on the other yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, he's on the other end. Yeah, and you recognize his voice almost immediately when he first starts coming on, for sure. I was gonna say his his least funny one is the one in Taxi Driver, but uh, <laughs> that's a, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, no, I, I I just really recommend this movie if you haven't seen it. Like I, said, I think it's on Max now, so like it's easy to find because um, it was hard to find for a long it? time. Uh, yeah, so but Did it's it's really it's on Max. I think it might be on Max. I think I've seen it pop up on there. Yeah, um, but I mean, it's still worth owning. I, I like this movie a lot. Uh, but yeah, if you're looking for, if you're like me and you like these one crazy night sort of movies, all these things that take place almost in sort of real time, um, I really, really like it. And I can't recommend it. But yeah, you, you, I guess you said you've seen it, and it's your number seven. So yeah, yeah, no, it's this movie was so. This was one of the few movies where when I when I went and looked at his filmography and I like made a note of every film on a, on a document for myself, mm -hmm. I kind of went, I don't know what this is. Like, I've never heard it referenced in any sort of conversation. It wasn't brought up in, in film school. I've never heard it be on like a best of mm -hmm. list. Like, I, was, I don't know what this is. And, and then, then you look I, at the runtime and you're like an hour and 35 minutes. Oh, well, snap. Part of it. <laughs> then I look into it and I'm like, hold on. It's, it's a comedy. It's mm -hmm. technically... 
the last movie in his career uh, to date, at least. Maybe he'll surprise us. But it's the last movie in his career to date that's not a book adaptation or a biopic. It is something right. different. Uh, it is... Uh, it's a comedy, technically. It's classified as a comedy, which it absolutely is. It is hilarious. Mm. Um, and it was just... It's so different. Again, I kind of gravitated to watching the different stuff. Like, uh, again, a movie that I'm I'm going to go out on a limb and assume is not on your list. Maybe I'll be wrong. Uh, mm. But uh, Kundun was another one that I watched. Kundun is just hard to find. I've never been able to see it or find it anywhere. I found a 1080 print of it on YouTube. Okay, cool. Because, yeah, I, I, if I was going to have to watch it, I was going to have to, like, buy a used DVD. Because, yeah, it's not streaming anywhere. It's really hard yeah, to find. I, I, I was able to find a, a full 1080 uh, version of the film. Oddly like enough, I remember the trailer really well. The, the trailer played a lot in movies I saw back in, like, 1997. Because I remember just them showing a lot of shots of, like, Tibet and, like, the Dalai Lama. And then at the end, the voiceover guy just goes, Kundu. <laughs> and I just remember that. <laughs> I don't know why. I remember trailer stuff from that's the nineties awesome. a lot. <laughs> Coon, dude, Coon, man, that's dude. awesome. I can totally hear that too. Like the oh, real, yeah. like uh, 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 the trailer guy, Tom Belafonte. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, one Dolly Lama. <laughs> <Coon, dude. laughs> no man, but so yeah, like I gravitated to the stuff that was more unique. Like and that was kind of yeah. what I sought out. And so after hours was certainly on that list. Uh, this movie was so much fun, man. You're right. It is very much one crazy night. It's a wild ride. And one of the things I like about the movie is it invested me and it sucked me in because every time you felt that the set piece was getting ready to change, it, it is genuinely a who's who of like, is it going to be someone new and fucking weirder or are we getting someone back? Because this movie does this thing like Cheech and Chong are in this, for example. And, right, and you right. hear on the outset, like Cheech and Chong are in a Scorsese film. Like that sounds weird, but mm -hmm. they are perfectly cast in this as these two characters that just rotate in and out of the story at various mm -hmm. points to the point where like you, you know, by the time you reach the end of it and they get their one final moment in the movie, you're like, yeah, they came back around. And it's like, right. The way that he alters these characters in and out and the way that they interact with Griffin Dunn's character and the escalating uh, issue that he's dealing with throughout the night, you know, down to, I mean, like without, I feel like I could say this without the context of the movie and not spoil too much. At one point he is chased down by a mob who are in an ice cream truck. And that is, yeah, no, this, it's, it's <laughs> just inescapable madness that you're with him of just like, Oh my God, I, I want him to just get out of and, the situation. And you, and the thing is like uh, yeah. nowadays, the feeling you get of delirium, I feel uh -huh. like is, is more often experienced. Like when you're sitting at home, uh, like, you've been on the computer watching YouTube videos or maybe you played video games or watched a movie too late and all of a sudden it's like four in the morning and you're like, fuck, I'm tired, but you can just yeah. go to bed. Imagine that feeling across town and you have yeah. no way of getting home and you're uh -huh. just trying to get to bed. Uh -huh. um, the movie, it is a perfect chain of chaos. Um, I was so shocked when I watched it, how much I enjoyed it for how little I had ever heard of it. Right. Uh, and I was so happy I did. This is one of those gems where I was like, I'm so glad I did this. I no, this is one of those ones ever. that I, I recommend to people. Yeah, if they like Scorsese, or again, even if you just want to see something different from Scorsese, and, and yeah, it, a lot of people like haven't seen this. Film. No, it, it still does. Like him doing something else, it feels like his movie. No, and again, it's such a simple premise and these simple locations and whatnot. But again, because it's him, you get maximum, you know, efficiency out of everything that he mm -hmm. does. And yeah, it's really, really well done. And this is one, yeah, I recommend to a lot of people. Uh, it's like one of those hidden gems that, like, if you haven't seen it, like, I definitely like throw it out there as a recommendation for sure. Yeah. What's your six? My number six is Raging Bull. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, yeah, Raging Bull is one that uh, I alluded to it a little bit before we went live, but uh, this is one that I probably hadn't seen in like 15 years. I remember the first ah, time I saw okay, it. That's yeah, okay. yeah. So like, and the first time I saw it, I did not like this movie like at all. <laughs> I was like, uh, Jake Lovato is a piece of shit. He's an asshole. This is really uncomfortable just watching him like smack his wife a lot in this movie and just go like argue back and forth. It's a lot of arguing in this movie. It's just like people yelling at each other and arguing and him pesky arguing and. Uh, you know, his brother and like, yeah, just, just again, uh, characters that are very unsavory, but I was like, but the boxing scenes are really good. <laughs> they're, they're really well done. Uh, but yeah, I, I had watched it cause I bought like a De Niro four pack or something and it was in there. That was the first time I saw it. I had heard a lot about Raging Bull. Anybody who's into cinephile, you know, culture or whatnot, you know, you know about Raging Bull. Um, but this is one that I, I'm really glad I rewatched it this week cause I had picked up the, uh, 
the Criterion 4K and it just because I've been itching to like rewatch it and revisit it because also I'd seen these Siskel and Ebert things and I've been digging a lot of their archives and whatnot. They each had Raging Bull as the number one film of their 80, of the 80s for both of them. Mm. They did this retrospective on the 80s. And I was like, all right, there's got to be something to this. Like, let me go back to it now that I'm older, <laughs> you know, a little bit wiser, hopefully, uh, than I used to be. Uh, and, and yeah, this movie's incredible. And, and if you watch it and if you can let yourself be absorbed again into this world of this character who yeah is not a good person like at all he is a piece of garbage <laughs> and he is a, a very unsavory person uh yeah he speaks uh poorly of his wife you know he beats on her he he does not like his family and all all that but then when you look into it and you and you uncover the levels of what it is and and i looked into some um you know reviews and whatnot and some analysis that the whole thing is a uh, the boxing scenes are 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 a direct result of him dealing with his issues who are like his dealing with his insecurity, dealing with his jealousy and whatnot and taking it out in the ring. And then how that correlates to like what's going on uh, outside of it. It's really, really good. And you can't ignore the performances. Like De Niro is absolutely this character, like to a core. Like if somebody were to argue that this is his best character he's ever played or his best performance, I'd be hard pressed to argue against it. Uh, he's really, really good, especially the stuff at the end where he's fat Lamada, you know, and the really pathetic fat Lamada in the clubs, you know, doing lame jokes to five people. With, uh, he has like a, like, a, like a fake kind of nose. It's thing, like a right? fake nose, but he actually did gain weight. He gained like 50 pounds for the last part. So he's like chubby and flubby and like, you know, and he's doing a bad like a uh, uh, Marlon Brando impression at one point, you know, of like of, of the contender, you know, uh, that sort yeah. of thing. Um, yeah, and it's really pathetic, but that's the point. Is he's like Scorsese is telling you this guy is a piece of shit and he's pathetic, and we're just gonna live in his world for a little while. And I, once I did that, I really, really appreciated uh, the movie and watched it on a technical level. The boxing scenes themselves are really well filmed, really well edited. They have a ferocity to them. They have a a, a brutality to them. Uh, you know the way they're shot, uh, the way they're kinetically done is great. Uh, but again, like even the rest of the movie is is gorgeously shot. With the black and white photography uh it's really really good so yeah i'm so glad i rewatched this movie because i i probably wouldn't have even made my list honestly had i not <laughs> um but yeah I, I made it a priority for this one because i wanted to reevaluate it um and it could even go higher in the future because yeah i i almost wanted to rewatch it again right after it was done so uh, i'm glad i did because yeah i think this is one that would appeal to more older you know movie fans that like i would not recommend like a 20 year old new movie fan watch this movie because you're probably gonna have the same reaction i had you're just not gonna like it um so so I do recommend rewatches on this one that if, if you didn't like it the originally we saw it, and I totally understand why, uh, give it a few years, like let it sit and just watch it for, for on a technical level. And I think you'll really, really enjoy it. Yeah. So. See, I, I feel like to an extent, I probably was you 15 years ago. I will yeah. say e even watching it and not enjoying it, I can appreciate like I sat here and I was watching it and I go, I don't understand how people like this, but I understand like at one point, wasn't it voted in like one of those like sight and sound, but it was like voted like one of the top five best films of all time. Like, it yeah, was no, it's very, like I very said, it's, highly acclaimed. It's like and, an Ebert's top 10 of all time. I like I said, they voted at that and I get it. Yeah. So I'm not there it. yet I with totally it. it. Yeah. I'm not there with it yet, but like I, I, I could be maybe someday. It, it is so technically well made. Um, It's like, like knowing this is the film that saves Scorsese's career, one hundred percent. Yes, it is. It is mm. worthy of that title. It's so well made. You're right. The boxing scenes are excellent, but even outside of that, mm. every other element of it is so well done. And even the direction of the arguments and the way that it compounds and builds mm. and the escalation of the of the issues in the various scenes, like it, it is all so well executed. It is technically probably one of the best films of his career. Mm. But you're right. I'm, and it's not just to me, it's not even just uh, it's not De Niro. Almost every character in this film, to some extent, is incredibly unlikable. And it just made it hard for me to find any kind of investment within it mm -hmm. to the point where I kind of walked away from it going. And this was one of those films that, like, if I hadn't liked something enough, maybe it could have vied for like if I hadn't seen Gangs of New York today, maybe this would have snuck in at 11 because sure. I can respect the movie that it is. How old are you again, Aaron? You're in your 20s, right? 20, 20, 20, 20. So you're literally almost what I'm talking about. You're yeah, almost yeah. me 15 I'm, I'm years at that ago. Age where so, like, so in about 10 years, you watch it again and tell me what you think. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come back to me. <laughs> it, it's like I totally respect it for what it is. I respect its place yeah. in his filmography. I can even concede that, like, it at the very least, it probably deserves a spot on this list. Like, I can totally, yeah. totally get that. 
Yeah. I just didn't enjoy it. And when there's so many other films that I enjoy more than this, it is hard right. to make something that is so well made but not enjoyable above it. Um, the, I, I will say the third act when they do go to Miami and it is fat. Uh, De Niro, yeah. I thought that was where the movie really kicked into gear for me. And I was really enjoying like the analysis of the character and what Scorsese right. had to say about it. I just wish we got more of that. Sure. I, I didn't like living in the world of just these angry people arguing for so long. Mm. Uh, my other note on the film is um, as one of the few, few people of my generation that has actually seen Cheers all the way through, it was nice to see Nicholas Colasanto in something that's not Cheers because I can't name a film that guy's in. And I didn't <laughs> know he was in this when I watched it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, holy shit, that's Coach. But like a mob boss. Well, you'll see some other familiar people like Frank Vincent is in this movie. He plays like uh, one of Pesci's buddies. And he's also Billy Bats and like and Goodfellas, the guy who tells him to go get his fucking shine box. Yeah. Uh, yeah and he's also in Casino. He's like Pesci's little henchman buddy that's like running around with Casino with him. Uh, so yeah, like you'll see a lot of familiar people like that. And then I went back and watched it and I forgot it was uh, Kathy Moriarty, uh, who was like his wife in this movie, who I mostly knew as a kid from Casper, as Miss, uh, as uh, <laughs> Kerrigan, you know, from Casper, like sort of the evil lady from that. And it was refreshing to see her, you know, in a much it's bigger, beautiful. much better movie. Uh, no, as much as I like much Casper. Just, well, as much as I like Casper as like a piece of nostalgia, you know, 90s nostalgia that I grew up with, you know, to see her in a more prestigious film was nice. Uh, she's no, really that's fair. Movie. Hey, man, yeah. it, After yeah. Hours was the same effect with Tommy Chong, man. Most of my exposure to that guy's that 70s show. And yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> after Hours is a step above that is probably a fair statement. Sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I get if you haven't reevaluated Raging Bull or if you're like Aaron or like me, really, like I was yeah, and no, you didn't love fair. it the first time, like give us some time, like revisit it. And again, what Scorsese does well is is dropping it you know, put yourself in the mindset that that's what Scorsese does. He drops you into these seedy worlds of these people that are very unlikable, uh, but let you live in them, let you stew in them. And it's kind of refreshing, um, you know, as opposed mm -hmm. to the happy go lucky stuff that everybody else does or the sugar coating. It's like, no, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Like, this is who this guy is. And this is apparently even. Lamada uh, in his book that it's based on, he went and saw the movie and was basically like, uh, yeah, I'm a piece of garbage, but you know what? I was way worse. You could have shown way worse, <laughs> you know, for real life. And even though the real life wife was like, yeah, it, it was actually way worse than that, what you even showed. <laughs> so he didn't even go far enough, realistically. <laughs> What's no, the movie? Which yeah. this wouldn't be the last time Scorsese says he does that either. He has a tendency to sort of pull back sure. a little bit, which I don't yeah. think is a bad thing. Right. Uh, What's your five? Uh, my number five is The King of Comedy. That is my number four. So, ah, okay. Go ahead. So we can talk about it. Yeah, no, The King of Comedy, this is one that was in that four-pack as well. Uh, and oddly enough, it became hard to find for oh, a while. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it was a really good four pack. And then, uh, but this is one that was again hard to find for a while. Um, right now, you can see on it's popped up on streaming again recently, but for a while, it was only on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> it was like on you somebody ripped it on youtube and hd uh but i had it on dvd um and yeah i think this is still de niro's most unique role he's ever done even beyond stuff like meet the parents and whatnot uh and yeah once you see this movie you will never forget rupert pupkin <laughs> and rupert pupkin is just he's the amalgamation of every delusional person you've ever seen these people who just live in their own world who have these aspirations and these dreams that will never come true uh but yeah live in this fantasy land of like you know who they are how important they are uh how good they are at something uh yeah and it's a really fascinating character study uh, of this guy who, yeah, thinks he's going to be this brilliant, you know, stand-up comedian, uh, Jerry Lewis, who, yeah, I'm not, I haven't seen like a lot of Jerry Lewis movies, but this is a really interesting, like Jerry Lewis performance as well. Cause he's playing a famous mm -hmm. guy. He's playing like a talk show host, um, who is like Rupert's like favorite talk show host. Um, but yeah, it's a really serious performance from him for the most part. And, uh, and yeah, his interactions with him and his back and forth, uh, what makes it unique is you don't know what's real in this movie. <laughs> The whole movie could be a fantasy and a delusion and you have no idea like you can pick through this movie and i'm sure there is some stuff that is real you know him waiting in the waiting rooms and whatnot or you know telling i'll, I'll just wait you know the some of the stuff in his mom's basement of him doing the doing the recordings you know with the painting of the the audience back there and getting yelled at by his mom <laughs> that's where all the famous kind of uh memes and things and, and sound bites of him going ma i gotta do this now oh, come on ma like it's really really funny uh yeah that's 
all no, that comes leave from. Me alone. Ah, I can't, I can't do this now. Uh, no, that's great. So some of that stuff is probably real. But yeah, as far as any of the interactions that he has beyond the first one with Jerry Lewis, uh, any of the stuff that happens on stage, any of the stuff that has the third act, you don't know. It could all be in his mind. All this fantasy and delusion, uh, even to where the the whole third act and the ending might might or might not have happened. You don't even know. It, it's it's a really fun movie to kind of go back and revisit. I've been gone back to this movie since I saw it for the first time five or six times and really just looked at you know how it's constructed again this Scorsese so it's really well done um but yeah I think it's a really fascinating movie that if people have not gone and checked out uh, I think they really should it's becoming one of my favorites like really really quickly this movie has aged like a fine wine oh when absolutely discuss, freaking when we discuss when we discuss celebrity culture when we discuss the the yes. delusion of people and like with social media and the walls coming down and the ability to communicate with people and people like, trying to acclaim celebrity status quickly or exactly, like, you know, in like an instant. all of it, this yeah. movie, like this movie made sense back in 82. It has aged so, so much better than you could have ever imagined. Uh -huh. And I think that is what helps it. Um, obviously on, on this channel before between the, like the podcast type shows and battleground over the years, uh -huh. I, I've always kind of jokingly proclaimed like, I, I like Joker, but I don't love it. And I especially take issue with the people, mostly from my generation, who probably have not seen this movie, uh, that proclaim that Joker is this original piece of artwork. And it's like, no, it's not. It's just King of Comedy done again. And it's wearing it on its sleeve because De Niro is literally playing the inverse role that he played in this movie in playing Murray Franklin, the talk show host. Um, this movie is everything that Joker wants to be. And Jokers are still a great movie, but this movie, the commentary is on point. The performances are, are excellent. From Jerry Lewis, he is great. Uh, Rupert Pupkin is such a memorable, like he's such a, and he's such a flushed character. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing that like, I think that's why Scorsese probably likes working with De Niro's because mentally it feels like he really gets in the mindset of these fucked up characters and he fleshes the character mm -hmm. so well and really puts you in this character's position mm -hmm. to the point where you almost want to find him relatable. But also if you're not a loony bag, you can look at this <laughs> and go, this is insanity. Yeah. <laughs> no, this dude is nuts. Yeah. 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 Um, And yeah, man, it's so, and like, the set design in this movie is great in that, like, he walks into the offices of the, of the late night show and it's like he walked into a sci-fi film. It's like, what is happening? But it yeah. plays into the dream-like aura that this film has even more so. Even the um, corny, like, light sky blue suits that he wears and the reds yeah, and, like, the like, really, like, obnoxious, like, cheap suits and, like, the, yeah, the everything, but everything that people are wearing and all that. It's, like, it's, it's really dreamlike and really weird. Yeah. And the other thing, though, that I have to give credit to because uh, I, I feel like as someone who is a lover of stand-up, stand-up in film is sometimes one of the hardest things to watch because unless you're actually a stand-up, I feel like right. you don't really know the how to nail it and how to make it work. The stand-up bit at the end of this movie is actually very funny, uh -huh. and I think that the delivery is great. And apparently, he like studied it for a year and like went to open mics, and you can tell that he put the prep in for that one sequence, right. because at the end of everything you've just watched, knowing how deranged he is, he's funny enough and relatable enough that you can see why the audience buys into this bit. So it's not a bit; he's a psycho, and he deserves. <laughs> The, you know, probably more prison time because he's rehearsed this over and over <laughs> and over again in his basement. So he's got the rhythm down. That's not the problem. It's just like, yeah, how he gets there. Yeah, it's just you know, he he knows how to do what he does because he's he's done this bit a thousand times in his basement in his mom's basement. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, this movie, yeah, it, it's totally. Yeah, it, it like Aaron said, age is like fine. Why it's great, uh, yeah, for celebrity culture, for people trying to, uh, yeah, become sort of instantly famous and latching onto any person, or yeah, again, thinking that they're friends with people they've seen on TV or seen online <laughs> that they're closer to them than what they really are, you know, where they they could give a shit about you like, <laughs> and don't know this, who you are. This guy, this guy is a stan. He yeah. is a Swifty, one hundred percent. Swifties uh -huh. don't come for me. I'm sorry, but like. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Watching this, let's be real. Uh, yeah. What's your number four? <laughs> okay, so getting back to my list. Uh, number four is uh, Casino. Okay. This was, I'll just say quickly, because I don't have much to add. Uh, I watched all the other gangster films before I got to this one, and just kind of when I don't know if I can do one more. Okay. Uh, so I didn't watch it. Go ahead. 
No, I, I've seen the casino a lot. Um, yeah, I, I really, really like casino. Uh, and yeah, sure. I mean, I sort of get the criticism. It's like, you know, it's five years after Goodfellas. But at the same time, it's like a completely different era. It's a completely different type of gang and mob, you know, than just like a New York City mob. It's it's mm-hmm. like, it's Vegas. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's certainly it's it's De Niro and Pesci again. Like, I get that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And De- Pesci's still playing a psychopathic killer, you know, Nikki, who's even actually more psychotic in this movie than he is in uh Goodfellas. Um, but I think De-, De Niro's playing a different character. You know, he's playing, um, you know, this guy who's who's kind of trying to be on the straight, straight and narrow and really actually run these casinos and really actually like sort of be, you know, straight. I mean, he's still got his tendencies and whatnot. But uh, again, I just like living in this world. And I think it's really fascinating to just live in like, I can't forget it's the 60s or the 70s. I can't remember. I think it's the 60s. Um, but uh, I think it's like I think it blends into the '70s eventually at the end of the movie because it takes place over like ten years. So it's I think it eventually blends into the '70s. Uh, but yeah, I, I really like seeing old Vegas, uh, seeing some of these sets when the mob was running Vegas, uh, it really seeing just how everything works, all the all the cogs in the system. Uh, again, there's, it's a series of just super memorable, crazy scenes. Uh, every little character, and this is again something that Scorsese does well. Every little scene and every little side character is memorable from the cowboy guy who puts his feet up on the on the poker table to uh you know don rickles getting hit in the head with a with a telephone <laughs> you know to uh yeah pesci's little buddy you know frank vincent uh you know doing what he does to pesci at the end of the movie uh to james woods just being a total creeper and a stalker and a control freak over sharon stone in the movie you know being like the former boyfriend the really skeevy i was gonna say boyfriend. I, like when I was analyzing these movies at first and kind of picking the order to watch them, and the thing that, aside yeah. from, I've heard Sharon Stone's excellent in this. Uh, the, yes, the, yes. Aside from that, James Woods is just the, like really okay. By the way, it's uh 1973 to 1986. Okay, so it's like 70s into the 80s. Okay, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I know it takes place over a while, so like because everything changes around, like the clothing changes and the you know set pieces change and whatnot. Um, but yeah, every, everybody like has like little memorable moments. Um, yes, again, it's long, but it moves like it moves like Goodfellas. It just it just chugs along, and like you don't feel bored at all. Like there's always something going on. Um, and yeah, I just like being with these characters and being with this world. And again, it does have that escalation uh, to where you know uh, the character of Nikki Pesci's character is getting more and more psychotic, more and more violent. You know, he's he's messing up all of De Niro's plans and whatnot. So you do feel that escalation of like the back and forth to where the tension between them uh, gets higher and higher throughout the movie to where they're they're butting heads on on how to run things and whatnot uh, to a very, you know, very, very violent kind of finale, at least one of the characters. Um, yeah, and I won't even spoil it if you haven't seen it, but yeah, it's the no, way, no. yeah, the way one of them goes out as brutal. I'll just say cornfield. <laughs> if you know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's bad. Uh, but yeah, it's, yeah. And, and yeah, Sharon Stone, the way she gets more and more crazed uh, over time, you know, doing drugs and uh, how much De Niro is kind of the most level headed person in the movie realistically. <laughs> so it's kind of different for him. Uh, he's kind of the anchor of the movie, you know, dealing with all the chaos around him. Uh, but yeah, again, the way it's shot and everything just is so kinetic uh, in that Scorsese way. And all the characters are, really really flushed out you just get them and uh yeah i i feel like this more and more every time i watch it and it's one i go back to a lot and just put on even in the background just because i like just being in this world yeah that's totally fair it, it again his movies generally are so excellent that everyone i didn't get to see feels like a missed opportunity and this was just a like i watched even the ones i rewatched. like i saw every film you could define as a gangster film before i got to this one and it was just like I'd rather try something else than do another, <laughs> no matter how good it may be. I'd rather yeah, try yeah. something different than fit this in. Uh, but no, I'm, look, you're not the only one. One of my best friends is a, uh, he, he's, he's a very interesting guy when it comes to his film taste, because he will not watch like a single Oscar film, but he's a Scorsese aficionado. <laughs> uh, and even he was like, you didn't watch fucking casino. You asshole. And I was like, all right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> casino only nominated for one Oscar for Seamus Stone. That's it. Is it? Oh, wow. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it got kind of overlooked for the most part. Maybe. Was 95 a particularly strong year? I, I have no idea. Yeah, I'd have to look it up and see. I don't know. I'm sure there's at least one or two movies I would put Casino over in that in that year. I mean, I can look it up, but yeah, it's uh no, I, I think I think it's really, really well done. And yeah, I mean yeah, I get the comparisons to Goodfellas, but even then, it's like again, 
you know, it's still a fucking great movie. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, that That's I put like on over, about the Irish over a lot of other movies. Yeah. yeah. It's like... He has a lot of films that are kind of similar. They're still yeah. great movies. They're still awesome because he does what he does really, really well. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and Casino is well worth your time, I think. Um, mm -hmm. You know, regardless, yeah, great performances all around. You get tons of people you'd recognize popping in and out throughout the movie. Great set pieces. Again, really absorbing you into this world. And if you're just curious about old Vegas, it's a great old Vegas movie. You know, just see how everything ran back then. So, I mean, yeah, so that Oscars was the year of Braveheart. <laughs> so there you go. Oh. You know, it is what it is. But I might put it in over Sense and Sensibility. <laughs> oh, probably, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Those films do well, though. Anyway, yeah. we'll go ahead and jump back over to my seven through four. Uh, my seven, of yeah. course, was After Hours. Mm -hmm. So we'll move on to my number six, which is Hugo. All right. It's all yours. Uh, yeah, man. I So as I said, this would have been because I was the right age for it. It made sense. This would have been the first Scorsese film I saw like when it was coming out. Uh, and, and my parents have I've always been. like They're not film people the way I am, but they like – my parents are, are weird they're not originally from america so when they came to america first and they like made friends like in their 20s they would go to all these parties for these different things and so it's still inundated in them to like watch all these events that they have no interest in so they'll watch the super bowl every year or they'll watch the grammys every year the oscars was always one of those things and so they'll watch like a movie or two that gets nominated so they've seen something that's there Right. Uh, and I remember they decided to watch Hugo that year because it was a kid's film. They could put it on and like not worry about who's walking mm -hmm. through. Um, and yeah, man, this movie, for a director who, who had never made a kid's film before, hasn't made a kid's film since, and probably will never make another kid's <laughs> film outside of his uh, performance in Shark Tale, uh, this movie has such a childlike wonder that even as an adult re-watching it, I still feel like is there. Uh, and I think, especially for being a film about, uh, you know, uh, I forget the director's name offhand, but like early cinema and kind of almost like diving into his childlike fascination with cinema and the concept of right. it, like you can feel the magic there. You can feel the love truly coming through. Um, I think the performances across the board are great. Asa Butterfield, Chloe Grace Moretz, uh, Ben Kingsley, Sasha Baron Cohen. Uh, all of them, I think, are really, really good. Um, the world building, this train station, is one of the craziest things you will ever see. Right. Uh, and it's such a it's such a great, well defined world. Um, yeah, and it just it it brings like at least to me when I watch it, it brings like pure good feeling. Like it is just it's got that wonder, it's got that sense of exploration, that sense of almost kind of like adventure. Um, it's a tight pretty much two hours uh which is a benefit sometimes when it comes to his movies um <laughs> and yeah it just it's it's kind of exactly what you're looking for if you're looking for almost like a palate cleanser in his filmography yeah. um and i think the fact that it is i have to give credit similar to after hours you have to give credit to somebody who does kind of have a defined style that people recognize when he can step out of that and nail it i have to give credit where it's due yeah, no, I saw it in 3D in theaters when it came out originally. Oh, how was that? <laughs> it was interesting, yeah, because it was also in 3D, but he shot it in 3D. So, like, it was really, really? interesting. Yeah, he actually shot know. it in 3D because uh, you can find uh, 3D Blu-rays of Hugo out there. They're out there. Oh, I'm good. You look for them. <laughs> now, I'm just saying, like, for the people who did, because it was around that, that craze, but he actually right, shot it for that, so it was interesting. Yeah, so, um, but again, yeah, I was interested because I was like, Scorsese doing, like, a family movie? Like, that's all right, how's this going to work? And, yeah, it's a good movie. My only little quibbles, and like it would probably be like number two, it was one of the ones battling for number 11. Like it'd probably be like mm -hmm. a number 12 or 13 on my list, something like that. Um, but yeah, like my only like little quibble about the movie is every time I'm really getting invested in like the Ace of Butterfield and Chloe Grace Moretz stuff and like the Ben Kings and stuff, I feel like he diverts to have like a wacky chase with Sasha Baron Cohen. And I'm just like, no, can we just like go back to the other stuff? Like his character is a little silly for me. Like, and it kind of cuts it's the fair. pacing for me occasionally when we have to like go back to him blowing his whistle and like running around with his dog. And like, and I'm just like, I, I he's okay in the role for what it is. I just feel like that stuff, you could have cut that stuff out of the movie and it really wouldn't make much of a difference for me personally. And like, I, I even think of like, would have made the movie a little bit better honestly like for me i just okay. I, I don't know that's just my my hang-ups i feel, it, like, but, I feel yeah. like sasha baron cohen outside of like the borat stuff 
Yeah. His career in film is kind of like playing the thing you cut away to. Cause like, even if you look at like, like this movie, I would agree with you. Uh, I'm trying to think of other films. He like uh, the Alice in Wonderland sequel. He's kind of like a cutaway thing constantly. Well, and, and like Sweeney Todd he has like the weird like barber Sweeney cutting Todd. scene. Yeah, it's like uh, I don't know if he's even really Lay like, Miz. Like, Miz, yeah, bit. yeah. Uh, even fucking Madagascar. Like King Julian's not really a part of the plot of those movies. He's right, just kind of yeah. there. That's like his career. So I mean, it's fine. It is what it is. But like every time I'm getting invested with like the Jude Law stuff, and, no, like the right. flashbacks, like I really Law. like that stuff. It's really great. And and I, I want you know I was like, oh man, oh no, he's gone. Like damn, I want to see more of him. Uh, but like that stuff's great. All the stuff of Ben Kingsley when they finally do the big reveals of like he's this guy who did, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I knew it was the uh, I didn't remember his name, but the trip to the moon guy, the guy who made a trip yes. to the moon. Uh, and yeah, that short film. And oddly enough, we did a rank them uh, over on Malcolm's channel. We talked about influential films in cinema, and I are argued for a trip to the moon and got it on the list because obviously it's like basically one of the first movies ever made. Yeah, no, I, but I was the only one who was going to bring it up. So I did. Uh, but yeah, cause, cause I just, I just rewatched a Hugo like a year ago. I watched this one like a year ago. It's been forever. Um, but yeah, it's like, all that stuff at the end where they, where they recover all this stuff and they do like the little film festival at the end and he makes a mm. speech. Like it's really emotional, like great stuff. I love all that stuff because it's like a love of cinema and Scorsese is paying tribute to him basically and early cinema and all that, all those revelations and like the way the stuff they have with the robot and everything is great. I love all that stuff. It's just for me, like the Sasha Baron Cohen stuff. I feel like you no, could have cut it. That's you feel fair. like you could have cut it and like it'd be a much – like more impactful movie for me personally, I feel but like I still maybe like it. because I saw it for the first time as a kid, it does not impact yeah. me as much because that stuff feels like it's there for kids to like. Right? No, it totally movie. is, and like, yeah, there's there's two different movies basically going on at the same time, but like, I get why it's there. Yeah. Um, but I still think the movie's good. Like, again, those are minor quibbles. Like, whatever, I can get over that when I watch it. But you know, that's yeah. like when he pops up and they do a chase. Like, I go to the bathroom and get a sandwich. You know, like, and I'll come back. You're and, like, I don't have to pause the movie. It'll no, I have to pause the movie. It'll be over in like five minutes, and I'll come back to the movie. Uh, so it's fine. It's it's all good but uh no i still like you <laughs> that's fair man uh I, I get it uh so then we'll go to my number five which is your punt from earlier uh taxi driver okay uh, yeah, yeah so uh, this is obviously I mean, obviously this is one of the ones that i first initially saw uh, as a part of film history class and sure. yeah duh uh duh. <laughs> <laughs> um I, I think over time I've come to like the King of Comedy. Obviously, it's higher. I like the King of Comedy slightly more. I feel like these two, not just because they both influence Joker, I feel like they're both about guys who struggle to integrate in society and suffer from their own delusions and how they go about doing things. And there's a lot to compare between the two journeys in these films. Sure. I think I like the King of Comedy more, but the character of Travis Bickle is just such an he's an enigm he's an enigmatic character. It's it's just such a well written character uh from paul schrader and the performance de niro brings and the level of unhinged that he hits by the end of this movie yeah. it's like if that movie were made nowadays de niro would be forced to undergo like mental health evaluations for how deep into this character it seems like he's going um it, like that just you'd never see something i feel like it's harder to see something like this nowadays right uh with just the way that the world kind of works and it makes the film that much more believable um the cinematography is in this is, is excellent as is most films but it's really great in this uh this is it's bernard herman right did the score bernard the score, herman yeah the same guy who did like psycho and all that yeah it's yeah, uh it's, it's interesting it, his final score um mm -hmm. excellent work in this movie um yeah man like this this is if i feel like it's not my favorite obviously it's not your favorite obviously mm -hmm. but i feel like if you had to point to almost a quintessential scorsese film i feel like right. this is truly where the foundation is laid um it would be one of those things where if somebody was like hey give me three movies that define scorsese as a filmmaker i'd be like yeah. taxi driver Raging Bull, Goodfellas. You know what I mean? Yes. Like I'd be like, I'd be like, there's your three you watch in a day to get like a sense of who Scorsese is, like for sure. Exactly. So I will fully acknowledge it in that aspect. Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead. What uh so obviously a little lower on your list, it's number eight. So go ahead. No, it still makes it again, you know, it's just for me, like like rewatchability is a big factor in like personal lists, you know, and it's like taxi drivers is not one of those ones I want to go and like rewatch a lot. Uh but I do revisit it like every two or three years, you know. I'll really dig into it. Like I, I listen 
listened to the cinephiles episode about it recently with like uh with roca and steve morris and like that mm. podcast is great by the way um yeah, but yeah, like, in -depth analysis. like really like scene by scene and it's really great and uh, that made me want to watch it again so i watched it again like for that um and yeah like you know it gave me a little more appreciation but yeah again on a technical level like you can appreciate every aspect to it all the interpretations of who travis pickle is like you know how much of the again the the post stuff you know of what he does is like a fever dream or not you know like it's you know did it actually happen what actually happened here um yeah what 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 he actually does um but yeah it's 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 textbook stuff about how do you score properly how to use a voiceover properly especially because i feel like too many movies rely on a voiceover but we really do have to get into his head and that's like the way we get into his head all those monologues where he's driving around talking about how he wants to wash away the scum of the streets you know and all that um yeah it's really fascinating and adds to it yeah his complications with trying to have a relationship you know are, are really interesting uh it it's really great appreciate how i feel like to an extent the art of the voiceover has been lost in right yes. so i feel like now it's almost used as a way to like fill in plot holes and like oh, just fuck, give exposition out of thing. nowhere but yeah the, the, the stuff in here is not for exposition's sake it's more just to get inside literally the head yeah. of our main character and like what he's thinking and um and yeah how he sees the world um i also have just been on a huge 70s kick over the last like two years aaron like i've gotten really into 70s yeah, movies we've talked about that right yeah, yeah really really into 70s movies and i love 70s new york movies uh 70s yeah. new york movies are just like i'll eat up anything that's 70s new york uh, so you can get a lot of that with like roy scheider movies like he did a lot of 70s new york movies uh yeah and stuff like this the original death wish like uh three days of the condor like all these movies that takes place in new york in the 70s not that i would want to live in 70s new york aaron because <laughs> i don't want to <laughs> live in 70s new york but like if i could visit it for a night like go back in time and just walk around 70s new york for one night and just see it but my closest thing i have is watching all these 70s movies that take place in new york it's a fascinating time period man and like i think it because new york especially in movies like this or french connection or you know the original yeah. death wish or whatever are a character on their own like just yeah, no, you can really york. feel the setting and yeah it, it's, it's wholly unique in a way that not a lot of other places can capture a setting and a feeling and a tone for a movie right um you're right it is unique and and uh, yeah there's a difference between admiring a time period right and wanting <laughs> Want to, to live there. in it <laughs> yes you, you, can, you can like uh, especially every year when it comes around to halloween inevitably someone's gonna dress up as a flapper and be like oh my god this was so much fun back <laughs> you did not want to live during no. that time no, Trust. no, no, no. I'm fascinated with, I know I'm, I have a fascination with 70s New York. Yeah, I would never want to live there, but I like these movies that really dig into 70s New York just because of how yeah, weird and seedy it was and the characters you would see on the streets and just the way yeah, everything looked. Everyone, and just everything is just like, I could watch a movie of just somebody, like literally like in this movie, somebody driving around in a taxi around 70s New York and be fascinating to me, like just to see everything that's going on. Yeah, just, uh, just a normal it. taxi driver. Like, that's what I mean. Not Travis Bickle. I mean, just see a dash cam from a 70s New York taxi driver and the people they encounter and the stuff they see. I would just love to see that. So I, I'll even go back just to watch it for that aspect. But uh, yeah, yeah I, I really dig it. So um, yeah, and of course, a, a great. very, very young Jodie Foster performance. Uh, yeah, she's yeah. excellent in the film. And no, she's is it? Um, oh my God, what's her name that plays his like initial love interest? It's uh, it's the girl uh, from Moonlight, Bernhard, right? or am I wrong? Uh, no, that's King of Comedy. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, that's right. That's King of Comedy. I'm getting my is it uh, uh, Sib Sybil Shepherd. Sybil Sib Shepherd. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, she's very good. Um, yeah, her reaction. Oh my God, when he takes her to the porn theater for their first uh, date is hilarious. Like it's so yeah. great. <laughs> Let's get in their RC Just, cola. Uh, that is the <laughs> you should probably have if that's what you're yes. taking. Yeah, no. Uh, again, early Albert Brooks thing. He's the guy at the campaign office. Like that's that's oh, fun. Okay. You know, yeah. to see him like bone around the movie. Harvey Keitel, yeah, pops up again. He, Harvey of Keitel course. was all in these. You know, all the way from Mean Street. Early films. Oh yeah, yeah. He's in like all of his movies, playing like the pimp guy. Yeah, for Jodie Foster. Yeah, I mean everything's great all around. Yeah, yeah. Not much more to be said other than Taxi Driver should. You know, it's definitely definitely one of those early defining Scorsese films for sure. It's just not a personal favorite because I don't go back and watch no, it all the fair. time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all it is. It's a tough movie to want to see. Yes. Again, for so many of these, it's like great movie, fun movie. Eh, no. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that's my thing. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, yeah, and then, of course, my number four, four was, was King The Comedy, King of so Comedy. So we'll go. go ahead and jump into – uh your number three man go ahead my number three is gangs of new york okay 
Yeah. Uh, so this is one that, yeah, I don't know you had earlier, but uh, yeah, this is one that I've always, and most people who know me know how much I love this movie. Um, see, this is a movie I have seen like 50 or 60 times, like legitimately. I put this movie on a lot. Uh, and, and I think this, I also have that personal connection we were talking about earlier. This is the first Scorsese movie I saw in a the theater uh, because I worked okay. in a movie. I worked in a movie theater in 2002 uh, to 2003. And uh, if anybody doesn't remember, by the way, uh, that the week it came out, it was also the same week as Catch Me if you can so you had a great scorsese movie and a great spielberg movie and two great leo dicaprio leo movies <laughs> leo dicaprio movies in theaters at the exact Did same they time the same week i don't know about the exact same week but they were both in theaters that christmas season you could go at to a the theater time. okay you could go go to a theater and watch both movies on a double bill if you wanted to at the exact same time that is absolutely, absolutely true that. Yeah, yeah no and, and i think i saw one one day and one the other day um but yeah you could absolutely do that back in in christmas so that's fun too. yeah no that's a great double feature right there yeah give me my leo double feature of scorsese and spielberg because they're two very they, good movies obviously. they came out five days apart gangs there of new york is december 20th catch me if you can came out on christmas so okay. you could go on christmas day and go watch both of them on the same day and that's that would incredible. be that'd what be a, great God damn, what a time what a, what a time right <laughs> I know, right? Uh, but yeah, no, hell of a thing. But uh, yeah, so I saw this movie in theater. That was the first Scorsese I got to see in a theater. Um, so yeah, I have kind of a connection to it because I would go in and watch this movie a lot on my breaks and stuff, just like little pieces because I feel like there's a lot of vignettes you can stumble into, you know, throughout the movie. It's kind of segmented stuff, you know, throughout the whole thing. Um, but I think, yeah, again, you talk about world building and wanting to live in this world. Like, again, I wouldn't want to live in this New York, but goddamn, is it a fascinating New York, you know? Uh, just every time I go and watch this movie, I catch something new in the background or I catch like something going on because they really built out this five point set and it looks amazing. Again, pr uh, something a lost art, man, practical set building I, and the, like, this watching, world building. It was I, amazing. I was watching the, the, there was like a behind the scenes thing on the movie where uh, he had brought George Lucas to set to like look yeah. at it. And Lucas is kind of like, uh, you can hey, green screen all this shit. You, know, you and can build this in a computer, right? And Scorsese like, just no. laughed at him. He no. just laughed. He's like, <laughs> no. look. No, why? He's like, no, I want to build this set and live in it. And, and that's and what I appreciate about this movie. This came out the same year as Attack of the Clones. Attack of the Clones, so yeah. So, philosophies were. Which is the better movie? Yeah, no, this movie's better. And I will forever contend that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, even, even just on a technical level, again, what Scorsese does, putting you in this world and fully engrossing you into it, and all these crazy characters, all these crazy people, all the chaos going on. Uh, again, it just seems like complete anarchy walking around this town. I mean, my God, people are getting mugged everywhere and beat up and these different gangs and all these kids running around uh, pickpocketing people and uh, just, yeah, it's nuts. But again, I love how kind of crazy this movie is. Uh, yeah, the, the the world that we're thrown into, um, yeah, with, with – uh, with DiCaprio here, and even the opening scene, yeah, the stuff setting up, uh, yeah, Liam Neeson and, and Daniel Day Lewis's uh, kind of background, um, it's really good. Yeah, the fight they have, the, the gang warfare they have, and then, uh, but it plays into it because he talks about how you know he was the last sort of honorable guy he ever you know challenged and whatnot, and uh, you know they don't make immigrants like him anymore, or something like that. But yeah, it's got all these themes of immigration and what it means to be like a true American and all this nationalism we see now. I think this movie has aged well in that aspect where you can. See yeah, people yeah. spitting, spitting the same stuff that Bill the Butcher kind of spits out in this movie, uh, you know. And yeah, no, he, he's he's a total asshole. But again, you see where he's coming from. You, obviously, you don't agree with him, but you see where he's coming from as far as like you know wanting like just true New Yorkers to be in New York. And the way they play the politics in this movie behind the scenes, I think is fascinating. Uh, all the voting day stuff and all the things they do with uh, the campaigns and whatnot is really interesting. All the gangs themselves are very interesting. How they all work. Um, yeah, just how this world works. I, I've always just loved just being in this world with these characters. Um, I mean, the only minor knock, and I think it's a pretty universal knock on the movie, is Cameron Diaz is very miscast in this movie. Yes. Uh, yeah, very, very miscast. Yeah. But again, to me, it's like a minor issue because she's not one of the main characters. I'm just focused on on DiCaprio's Amsterdam and Bill the Butcher, like for the most of the movie, and their, their dynamic and their back and forth and their relationship. She pops in every now and then, a couple of scenes, and we, we get back to the business. So it's not that big a deal for me. I can brush it off. Uh, I just more, I just more at this point just laugh at it every time she's literally doing her hearty tartar, you know, Irish accent. <laughs> no, it's it's pretty bad. Uh, but if you got a better, you know, I mean, she was popular at the time, so I get it. That might have been a studio thing, honestly. Uh, casting her, you know, that might have been forced on them, but who knows. <laughs>
with how much money Weinstein pumped into this thing, absolutely. It's oh, like you're putting so many fucking in this. But I, I do think it's really it's a really interesting DiCaprio performance that if you again if you put it in the context of the time, he was really coming off of he hadn't done much since uh, Titanic and uh, he was trying to no. shake that image. And this, you know, he's playing a much different character than he does in Titanic in this movie. Um, if anything else, my God, uh, how good is Daniel Day Lewis in this movie is Bill the Butcher. He's incredible in every scene. He just he just destroys everything around him with his performance. Mm-hmm and just completely absorbs in this character again a, a, a not a savory character but a fascinating character um and, and you know one that you're almost with you know in certain scenes and uh he's just so engrossing in everything he does the, the uh, best villains are the ones where you can find the logic and what they have to say oh no and he has a logic to it's his own logic but he has this logic of like no i mean the, all these people are invaders essentially is what his logic is and uh and yeah but again it's peppered with um you know great you definitely uh, listen to like can't do that in a small town or whatever the hell. Oh no, no, he would. He would absolutely be all that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but again, lots of great, um, you know, Escorsese is one to do. Tons of great recognizable people. Jim Broadbent is like the mayor of the town. Yes. John C. Riley is uh, the cop. You got Henry Brendan. Thomas as his buddy. Brandon Gleason, who's always great. Uh, yeah, as the guy who kind of runs for sheriff later. Uh, Stephen Graham is in there. Uh, yeah. Lawrence, Gill- Lawrence Gilliard from The Walking Dead, who people would recognize. Um, yeah, lots of people just peppered in this movie. Do you say and Henry now, Thomas? I feel like yeah, Henry Thomas was yeah, his Henry best buddy. Thomas yeah, is- his best friend in the movie. Yeah, um, but. He Again, just if anything, watch it for the set design and the the world that he's able to build practically, and all these people running around. It's, it's How madness. did it win that Oscar? I will never know. It's it's insane. Yeah, it's great. So. I just find this movie really entertaining. Again, a really entertaining rewatchable That's movie fair. that I think once I've, t- I've turned a lot of people onto this movie and it gets in your head and then you're like, man, I don't know, I kind of revisit, I want to revisit a lot of stuff. Cause again, a lot of really great just set pieces and vignettes, you know, the firefighting stuff, the voting day stuff, the boxing stuff, uh, you know, everything that they kind of bounce around in uh, is really, really fun and, and really entertaining. And I just love being in this world, man. And I've, I've watched this movie countless times. I just love it. This movie's great. <laughs> So yeah, it yeah. was so it, it was my number eight. So this was yeah. literally the last movie I watched before I was like, okay, that's set, we're good. Right. Um, you're right, Diaz is not in it nearly as much as like her like the fact that her face is on the poster next to the other two right. has more to do with the fact that she's a name. She's uh-huh. not in it necessarily as much as them. She, she's god, I, I don't even like I'm gonna be honest, I'm not even a big fan of Cameron Diaz as an actress that much right. to begin with. She's really out of play like like she's out of her depth as an actress being in a movie like this uh, she's miss Cass playing an irish woman because she can't do that accent yeah. she just everything about this does not work it's not film destroying though um no. i i don't know what it is and that's why i said i kind of want to rewatch it uh-huh. something felt a little out of place about dicaprio in this to me and it's not that he gives a bad performance but even compared to like Catch Me If You Can, which he would have shot directly after this, mm-hmm. there's something about the maturity in DiCaprio. It kind of still feels like he is a little bit like the kid playing dress up to be the adult. And I, I don't know if that's just like a mental game. That no, that's – but but Aaron, that's the beauty of it. That's the character he's playing though. His dad was killed when he was a kid and he never got a proper uh, a chance to grow up with a father figure in his life. He was thrown into an orphanage right after that. So he had to mature on his own and he doesn't have that – he's pretending to be the tough guy that he isn't really. Mm-hmm. And he's pretending – he's trying so hard to put on this facade of this like – mature character that he's trying to be but he's still that kid who never had like a proper childhood and whatnot and so he and he's thrown into this world all of a sudden and he's trying to like put on a face of like a tough guy you know and trying to trying to integrate into this world that he's and see, that's, that's about. why that's why i said like i think on rewatch i think it may click uh, a little more for me i don't know obviously i just saw it but this is like just initial right. thoughts truly but like maybe upon a rewatch it'll sit a little better with me and it'll rise but certainly in terms of sheer entertainment value you're not getting much better than this in his filmography it is entertaining as all fuck daniel day lewis is one of the best actors of all time and this continues Uh to cement it bill the butcher is a great character and Uh and he nails it to a t uh again as someone who likes like looking up behind the scenes stuff about movies one of my like one of the funniest stories i've ever read is because technically, when this movie was going into pre-production, Day Lewis was in one of his like retirements where he'll disappear for a couple of right. months and be like, "I'm retired." Yeah. yeah. And Scorsese, he was considering doing it because he had already worked with Scorsese on Age of Innocence, 
and Scorsese set up a meeting and he basically ambushed him with DiCaprio and then DiCaprio brought Tobey Maguire with him because they're buddies in real life yeah. and they were basically the entire meeting apparently was just them sucking up to him and being like listen man like apparently a real quote from Tobey Maguire was like if you are an actor as talented as you are you almost have like an obligation to bring that to the screen it was just kissing ass for an entire right, yeah, bunch yeah. and it got him to say yes and that's awesome because he's so good in the movie. And you're right, the supporting cast, again, similar to what I talked about earlier with The Irishman, uh -huh. the supporting cast raises the pedigree of this film so, so much. Uh -huh. um, it, they are excellent. You're right. Uh, Liam Neeson in his small role, John C. Riley, uh, Brendan Gleeson, Henry Thomas, like they are all such great performances, such interesting characters that just help build this world out uh -huh. and make it an incredibly entertaining film. Um, mm -hmm. Also, 2002 for John C. Riley, possibly one of the best years of an actor ever. Mm. Like the dude is in Chicago. He was in hours. He was in like this dude had a hell. Which, of a by the way, I think Chicago was also in theaters at the same time that Christmas. So again, <laughs> more stuff. I, I, I literally think it was. Yeah, okay. but yeah, he he had a couple of good years there. Sneaky good years there. Yeah. For sure. Dude is, he is, if all you've, and I'm speaking to people of my generation when I say For this, sure. if all yeah. you've ever seen is Step Brothers, expand out a little bit. He is so much more than that. Go watch Boogie Nights, go watch Magnolia. Yeah, uh, yeah a couple of those movies where he's his like. PTA work, yeah. Yeah, his PTA stuff is really, really good. Uh, even Heart Eight, an uh, earlier movie he did it with PTA mm -hmm. with him and uh, Phil, Phil Baker Hall, uh, really good in that as well. Um, yeah, go see some of his 90s stuff <laughs> before he got into the, the Judd Apatow, Adam McKay world, you know, that sort of bouncing around there uh yeah, yeah get out of that and go watch his early stuff it's good so yeah. so my number three is similar as how that one was your punt uh this is uh my punt from earlier which is the departed okay um yeah. this movie in terms of filmmaking might honestly be my favorite of his now this was the other one that i saw today uh, this was this was the movie in particular. So we delayed shooting by one day, and it was because there was mm. one movie that I wouldn't have had time to see if we hadn't. I was like, at the very least, I have to see this one film. <laughs> and then it's Thank funny you, you send me you send me the other list of stuff you're interested, in, and then I told you I was like, no, go watch Gangs of New York. I love Gangs of New York. <laughs> when you said you had to watch, I, I, like, I purposefully hid this I without without this. without blatantly saying it's in my top three. Go watch Gangs of New York. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I kind hopefully. of had a feeling I was like, oh, that right. might be high on his list. Maybe I should check it out because he's right. Like, yeah, yeah. Enthusiastic. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> right. And, hey, hey, a very fun movie. Um, okay. Yeah. But yeah, so the, the Departed. And again, I, I did just see it today, so this is recency bias a little sure, bit. Sure, sure, sure. Filmmaking-wise, it might be my favorite of his. I feel like it is so technically craft, like craft-wise, it is so well executed. Mm -hmm. The movie is at all times both disorienting and incredibly easy to follow because the whole rat element of it and the idea that people are kind of on opposite teams than what you're seeing is not a twist element, which I appreciate. It is a yeah. part of the film. You're supposed to know Wow. roughly who's playing for what team here and i like that uh and so it allows uh specifically dicaprio and damon to build into those performances and build into their character of playing wow. both sides the supporting cast once again are excellent i mean you can run down the list mark Wahlberg, yeah. academy nominated for this film again uh, uh, the one weird thing where people were like the one acting nomination that the departed got mark Wahlberg, and that's it <laughs> Interesting. Which, to be fair, for his one liners, his one liners alone. No, no, there he's hilarious, and it might be his most natural role he's ever done because it's just him playing a Boston cop. You know what I mean? It's and so just good. yeah, yeah, the, he's the, really good though. God, the the uh, I forget who delivered it on because it's a back and forth between him and Baldwin have like the best back oh, and yeah, forth yeah. in this. And I forget who which one of them says it, but it's the like, oh, something about I slept with your mom. By the way, how's your mother? She's fucking, tired from visit, my tired fucking father. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. no it's so, movie. but it's so seamless. Like they just throw it back and forth so effortless. No, it's really good. Um, yeah. Obviously, the last great performance from Jack Nicholson, and uh -huh. fuck, is he good in this? Yeah, he's really um, good. Playing, uh, basically playing Whitey Bulger, but 
I wish he would have retired on this instead of how do you know with Paul Rudd. <laughs> oh, dude, I was I was saying that earlier because my brother watched this one with me. I was like, because yeah. he he was like, this would have been around the time that he retired, right? Because he still kind of looks like I was like, he made two yeah, movies yeah. after this, and it's the bucket, bucket list. list yeah, and and that, yeah. How is it? How do you? How do you know? Yeah. How do you know? And I was like, he should have just left after this. It's the same with uh, Gene Hackman, where he does Welcome to Moosepore, and that's his last movie. When <laughs> when when, when as 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 you know as whatever is behind enemy lines, and it's a more prestigious movie. Movie, then you know, welcome to Moose Board. He could have, yes, yeah. adios after that movie, you know what I mean? Like, so that's why everybody's been like, Hey, Gene, you want to at least do one more, buddy? You really want Mel Welcome to Moose Board to be your sponsor? Or, uh, uh, Con- Connery retiring on, uh, on League, uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, like, oh, come on, one more, give me one, <laughs> give me something, uh, yeah. But yeah, and and so he, he's excellent in this film. I mean, just the, the, I mean, talk about the banter between Baldwin and Wahlberg, the banter between him and DiCaprio is some mm. top-notch shit uh they have great back and forths uh damon has great chemistry with uh, vera farmiga in this mm-hmm. their back and forths are really great like this movie is almost wholly dialogue driven but it is yeah, yeah, effortlessly yeah. entertaining the entire time mm-hmm. um yeah like I, it's just it's such a strong screenplay from william monahan it is so expertly made the only reason it sits in third place is because and i think this is kind of by design I don't think there's one character that you can really latch on to and like mm. get invested in fully because it never lets you get to know any of them well enough. It, they all service the story that's being told. Um, whereas the other two films that are one and two, uh, I think do a much better job at investing you in the characters. That is the one weakness this film has, but mm. expertly everything else, I think the movie is so well executed. Uh, like it's two and a half hours. It breezes by uh, and I, I like, I'd go back and watch it again. I actually, I bought it. Like, I rented it on yeah. Amazon, yeah. and then it was on sale for like six dollars today. And I was like, "Fucking, I'm buying it because I know I'm gonna want to watch this again at some point." So, yeah, for sure. So, uh, no, I, I like The Departed again. It's just one that I don't go back to as much, and I don't even know why. Because last time yeah. I watched it about a year ago, it was like, "Oh yeah, this is really, really good. I should watch this movie more." Uh, you know, and I know some people watch it a lot. I know Henry watches this movie a lot. It's in his his top, you know, fifteen or so, something like that. Um, yeah, and the people really dig it, dig it. And, and don't, don't get me wrong, I certainly appreciate it. Um, it's on my actual top eleven, so I do like it. Um, and yeah, I, I like it every time I watch it. I I don't know just what it is. Like it's like those. Again, I like more of these like New York movies than Boston movies. Maybe that's yeah. what it is. <laughs> you know, so it's very Boston. Boston. It's very Boston. No, so Boston. no, for sure. If you made a list of like top ten like Boston Boston movies, like yeah, the part is on there for sure. This it's movie. like. Uh, is so boston <laughs> it's very very boston and no so i appreciate that i'm just more fascinated with new york uh but yeah uh, like if we're if we're, if, if we're <laughs> on uh, cameron diaz's accent in gangs in new york baldwin could have done a bit better here man that maybe is so a little bit a little bit yeah but uh again like you said but everybody's chemistry is so good with each other and um oh, and yeah I, I like i like the games that they play where like we know whose side everybody's on but obviously the people in the movie are you know don't yeah. know who side everybody's on so it keeps us on on those pins and needles yeah, yeah all the way up until the finale it's really good and sure is the is the shot of the rat pretty on the nose yeah it is but at the same time like whatever it is what it is i guess it's for those couple of dumb people in the audience who don't get it <laughs> yeah he's a rat <laughs> it, it is what it is uh, but yeah, <laughs> if you didn't get it yet, <laughs> if you hadn't got it, then you know he's a rat. Uh, yeah, he's a rat. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a great movie, and uh, you know. The, the debate is always on, you know, Scorsese's, you know, he finally got his Oscar for this movie. Should he have gotten it earlier? Yeah, he probably should have gotten yeah. it earlier. <laughs> probably for Raging Bull, you know, or at least Goodfellas. Yeah, for one of those two, at least. There's a couple uh, in between. Uh, yeah, several in between. Yeah, he probably could have gotten it for uh, and should have gotten it for. But, uh, hey, at least he's got one on the mantle, and it's still a really good movie to get one for. So, you know, you can't be too mad. Uh, it's not like they gave it to him for, yeah, one of his, you know, lesser movies or, whatever, you know, something like that. He won because. Best Picture for air best director for age of innocence it's like what <laughs> really yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, okay <laughs> age of innocence which does not make my list i have seen it i didn't watch it this year but uh I don't yeah, like I gave period. that one a miss. <laughs> Look, I, I don't like period piece dramas with people wearing powdered wigs and ballroom dancing and shit. I don't like that shit. It's just not for I, me. I took look, one look at that poster and just yeah, like, I, I can always tell because of a poster. Look, if it's one of those movies, it's just one of those movies. It, look, if you like those movies, 
good on you, cool. It's not my sh- that's not my bag. I don't like those movies. Yeah. Like they bore the shit out of me. So if you like them, cool. Even Scorsese, I gave it a shot because it was Scorsese. But it's like, and it's same with Kubrick. Like I love every Kubrick movie other than Barry Lyndon because it's one of those fucking movies. <laughs> and I'm just like, ah, damn it. Even you made one of these. Damn, you were almost perfect. <laughs> other than Barry Lyndon, <laughs> I almost like your entire filmography. Other than that, uh, yeah, it's so close. Uh, but yeah, Age Venice is not on my list. Spoiler alert. It's not in my two or two or one spot. <laughs> <laughs> so re- realistically the question is do we have in which order, order in, do in we which order them? yeah or do we flip we'll see so let's find out what's your number two good fellas okay that is my number one but i, I won't punt it we'll talk so about we're it. just we're just flipped so we have the exact same one and two though yeah yeah, yeah. that's fine because because we might as well say it my number one's wolf and your number two's wolf isn't it Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> we have the same one and two, just an opposite order. So, and and literally. Which, which one do you want to talk about first? You want to do Goodfellas? Go ahead. Yeah, we can do Goodfellas. I mean, it's really like what is what is there to really say about Goodfellas? It has been said by everybody on the planet about Goodfellas. You know, I mean, again, we talked about it. it's one of those three that if you had to recommend uh you know a couple of scorsese movies like who doesn't recommend goodfellas as one of those scorsese movies uh but you know yeah it's infinitely rewatchable it's breezy it's entertaining uh it has incredibly memorable and and great characters again skeevy characters who do you know kind of despicable things but you like them you kind of like all these characters again it's like you know uh henry hill says in the movie i always wanted to be a gangster you watch this movie you kind of want to be a gangster they have really fun lifestyles it's the most likable the life will ever look. Right, yeah. It's like, but yeah, man, that looks so much fun going into a restaurant and getting escorted to the front and passing out $100 bills just because you can. You know, like, yeah, it looks really appealing and entertaining. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's again, he, he does it so seamlessly, Scorsese he does, that, man, this movie just flows so well. You almost forget how well it's being done. And you're just like, well, goddamn, like every scene is good. Every sequence is good. Every line of dialogue is great. Uh, so mem- like, you know, so quotable, so memorable, everything that happens. And I, I want to also contend that I think Ray Liotta is just as good as Pesci and De Niro in this movie and doesn't always yes. get the credit he does yes. for his performance. Because, man, you watch that whole sequence where he's like in super cocaine paranoia mode thinking the helicopters are flying over his house and he's just as damn good as anybody else in that movie especially during those sequences he's great no one's gonna sit here and say that overall ray Liotta's career caliber is as good as either of those two but in this movie he is spot on beat for beat with them no he is for what he's doing he is doing it exceptionally well obviously it's it's my it's my number one like i would also throw in terms of performances like the paul servino and lorraine brocco are also up there everyone is hitting it beat for beat not that they're not in wolf but like everyone in this is nobody's slacking even again even in the the basically one scene that frank vincent has like i said i referenced earlier the go get your fucking shine box scene sam jackson is stacks yeah Yeah, but i mean frank vincent in that one scene creates a super memorable character that you almost want to see you could watch a whole movie of that character you know uh you see the kid who plays uh spider in like the two sequences where he plays just bringing the drinks or whatever and his back and forth with pesci is super memorable everything yeah. is memorable in this movie every character he creates uh even you remember that, even that like basically scene of cameos where it's that shot through the bar where they're just walking mm-hmm. through and you're like and that's that gangster and that gangster and that gangster yeah, yeah, yeah right each one of those is an interesting movie waiting to happen Right, and Frankie and Fat Fingers or whatever, or the two-timer guy who says everything twice. Like, yeah, they create these little moments that you're like, yeah, you can watch a whole sequence about each of those characters, and they're great. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, that's what Scorsese does best is he puts a button on everything. The guy at the beginning who we don't really see later who, like, threatens to put the mailman's head in the oven. <laughs> you know, like that guy, the guy at the taxi stand. Like, he's great. Uh, you know, all those characters are great and make these little moments. Uh, the way he just – get you fascinated about the little details when they're making the food in the prison, you know, they're making the sauces and making the garlic and, you know, all the little details they put into it. It's just so intricate. Um, and it makes everything so, so interesting. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's an infinitely rewatchable movie. And it's one of those ones that people say, yeah, you can drop into this movie at any point and enjoy it. You know, if it's on TV or something, now that I recommend watching it on TV with the 250 F bombs, (laughs) same as with our, the number one movie that I have, obviously it's the same way. Uh, but yeah, Oh yeah, no, you wouldn't want to even try. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what's what's there really to be said about Goodfellas? It's an incredible it's film. A it's, it's a classic. It's, it's one of those movies you can watch and love from the first viewing. Like I, I challenge like you not to love it from the first. And it's only one better. of the few films in cinema in the modern day that yeah. has been built up to the extreme. It's been built up to, and it can still match the hype. It right. is 
genuinely that good. Yes. Uh, now, I, from the jump when I asked you to do this, uh-huh. I had a feeling Wolf might be your number one because we've talked about right. this movie before. Yeah, yeah. Jump into Wolf then. Go ahead. Because Wolf, I, I swear to God, I'm not exaggerating. Since this movie came out, I've seen it over a hundred times. I'm not exaggerating. That's insanity to me. Like, I fucking love this movie. I love everything about this movie. I think this so is, good. dude, I think this movie, it's the most enter, purely entertaining movie he's ever made. I think it's one of those purely entertaining movies ever made, ever. period, in yeah. Hollywood history, ever, period. This is the absolute fastest three hours you will ever watch in cinema history. Now, Goodfellas is close, because Goodfellas breezes along for three hours really damn fast also. Uh, but God damn, does this movie fly by for three hours. I mean, you have no... I, you can watch this movie and go, oh my God, it's been three hours? Like, this is incredible. Because there's not a single boring, dull moment in this movie. And I think the anarchy... I love movies that are like pure anarchy and just pure zaniness and just you have no idea what's coming next and every time you think they can't top themselves they continue to top themselves because gremlins 2 is like that for me like i love gremlins 2 because it's pure anarchy and they just keep building and building and building on you know the the craziness that you see in the yeah. zaniness but i mean it starts out with the shot of them you know throwing the dwarf guy and you're it like opens with dwarf throwing yeah and, and you, you think, think it can't can be top no, we can definitely top it, and we're going to top it multiple times throughout this movie. Uh, again, you may not remember everybody, particularly his, like names or whatever, but all the characters, the little side characters that pop up are lots of fun. The, the entire ensemble, everybody has a memorable moment or a scene or something or some memorable lines. Uh, DiCaprio, it's understated that like he absolutely could have won the Oscar that year. For, he should have won his Oscar. so damn this. good. He's so damn good. And yes, he's manic and he's crazy and he's drug-fueled. And whatever, but god damn it, the scene when he's just on the quaaludes alone trying to get down the stairs is one of the most masterfully physical performances I've ever seen in a movie. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, he's amazing. His his energy, you see again his the wall that you know, we talked earlier about the walls closing in. You feel that in the third act in this movie when they're cracking yes. down on everybody and they're arresting people and everybody's doing extra drugs and just running I, all over the place and you feel it like it, it's everything's going nuts. I yeah. hate to say it, but I feel like because we're three we're now three films removed from its release, yeah. I don't think he will ever top this in, in the grand right. scheme of his career. I don't think he'll ever make one better than this. Because I just think he threw everything at the wall for this movie and was just like, fuck mm-hmm. it, let's just go for it. You know, let's just have boom everywhere and drugs everywhere and let's set the record for f-bombs and let's do this and you yeah, know let's dude. just let's I just mean, go for it it's like, nuts jonah hill in this movie he's so awesome is he's so great fucking like so he breaks me watching this movie yeah. the uh like so what are you you married to your cousin yeah well you know she grew up yeah, hot. Well, like, all my know, friends want to fuck i wasn't gonna friend. let somebody else fuck my cousin so i was gonna fuck my cousin myself you know like yeah it's just, it's so i could i could yeah, quote this the, movie start to finish the, but yeah the, 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 the back and forth between him and rob reiner with the twenty six thousand dollars on fucking sides like, <laughs> he's like yeah but you know we had to order sides we had to, yeah the sides did cure cancer you know that's, that's exactly what it is why we ordered so many of them <laughs> you know <laughs> so, well, <laughs> Just the, the idea that, like, somebody with a creative wit like him is working with someone like Scorsese. Yes. And I can just imagine the various takes of just try this, try this, try this, just go, go, Well, go, uh, go. They, they were doing so much that DiCaprio almost had to get into the into that level. And he's not really a guy that does improv, but, like, Jonah Hill was so good at it that they were, like, pushing him and making him better at it to just go and just roll with it because he played almost like the straight man in a lot of those scenes, just going yeah. with whatever Jonah was talking about. Uh, and, yeah, it, you feel like – yeah, that aspect of it against the chaos of all the scenes where they're going through the 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 offices, you know, with everybody screaming on the phone and just throwing shit everywhere and just hitting stuff with bats and and all that. But again, and then you have amazing movies. I, again, I could watch a whole movie of Matthew McConaughey's character, like yes. running his running his office, you know, that Mark guy, like running his own, his thing, because like he's such a fascinating, funny interesting character that you're like i could watch a whole spinoff of him doing his thing in this movie I, I would it's great nothing, i would love nothing more than a boss where every time i clock on it's just as as excited as you can get right. three two, two one, one. Oh. <laughs> five thousand shares in the hole <laughs> Boom. you know like yeah just yeah maybe you're gonna bring us two martinis and then about five minutes six and one half minutes later you're gonna bring us two more martinis until one of us passes the fuck out <laughs> yeah no he's so good so good it's so quotable it's just so memorable uh every scene is just a banger like for me every scene has something that just sticks out that either makes you laugh or shocks 
stops you or uh, whatever. And yeah, I, I, everybody's so good in this movie. Kyle Chandler is understated in this Kyle movie as the, as the FBI guy, like, you know, his back and forth with DiCaprio on the yacht, you know, when they're having yeah. their kind of little sort of bribing <laughs> thing that he's trying to do with him is great. The way he plays it, he's great. I mean, you get little characters. Yeah, he's like, you see Rob Reiner's outburst when he does the, the fucking equalizer. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> oh, yes, you're right. Uh, so. Favreau with his small yeah, Favreau. Role. Yeah, he's, he's so smooth when he shows up. And I mean, you know, obviously Margot Robbie, like, yeah, this was her yep. big breakout and she's incredible in the movie. Like this is, this is a star making performance. Like if there ever was one, you could point and be like, no, that's a star making performance. And you can see why uh, she's and, great, and but even, everybody's so good. Everybody. Even before she shows up, like, I feel like for the small part she has in the film, uh, Kristen Milioti is his first wife. Like, Oh yeah, she's this, great. The emotion yeah. in her scenes and like this whole yeah. thing falling apart because of the path he's taken. Like she uh-huh. really makes you, feel that and obviously this is the exact same time i believe that she was becoming the mother on how i met your mother so like uh-huh. very different transition for her there as an actress but uh-huh. uh, a great job nonetheless yeah no i mean uh, not a whole lot more to say than other than i think this might be the most entertaining movie ever made <laughs> <It's true. laughs> i i and uh, yeah it, i i'm not exaggerating when i've i said i've seen it at least a hundred times if not more i put this movie on all the time like just in bed just for like just to put it on like i've done it so many times and half I the time watch, i'll sit down and watch like, it i, I will just it. pull up scenes if i want to laugh yeah and just watch a scene the, the three movie. movies i've seen the most times in the last 15 years that i put on all the time oddly enough two are from a single filmmaker but wolf of wall street django unchained and the hateful eight i've seen more times than any other movie in the last 15 years respect that, that on the hateful eight Love the hateful eight, dude. If we did a Tarantino, man, that would be flirting with number one. Like I dude, love I, the I, hateful I, eight. That man, I, I I really really I got to see that in film print in theaters. I really mm-hmm. enjoyed that. Love me um, late, but that's a whole nother list for a Tarantino thing. But yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll wait so, for that movie to finally come out. <laughs> whatever that film critic movie is, yeah, that's gonna come out. We'll do it around then. Yeah, we'll, for we'll sure. Wait. Uh, so yeah, so that is going to bring us to the end of our individual lists. Uh, so I, I we know what our one and two is going to be. Um, right. Let's figure out the rest of the list first, and then we'll come back to that discussion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we'll start with, uh, okay, so I've kept track of what we have in common. We had seven total films in common, so that's pretty good. Uh, all right, so do we want to do Gangs and Departed first, where one's number three and then one's lower, or do we want to do King of Comedy first, where it's our four or five? Man, I feel like, yeah, that, that Kings of Comedy thing is uh, because they're both flirting with that top three and we both had it so close. That kind of d- nudges in there, don't you think? I think, yeah. Yeah, I'm good with it. Yeah, so, yeah I'm fine right, with so that. It's a great movie. I love that movie, yeah. We'll do the King of Comedy at three. Yeah. And then that means Gangs of New York is going to take four. And then Departed at five, right? <sighs> yep. All right. And then if we just keep putting in first what we had in common, that would put Taxi at, Driver at six. And then after hours, we literally both had a seven, so that's a shoe in yep. for that. <laughs> yeah. So it'll slot in there perfectly. So uh-huh. Taxi Driver will come in. And at then six. everything else was all over the place. So <laughs> good luck. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So we have that in place. So, what is your next highest film? Uh, casino. Or, I mean, Casino didn't get mentioned, but I was in my top five, so shouldn't that throw in there somewhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm pulling mine back up. Yeah. All right, so my next – you said Casino was your what? Number four. Okay, yep, that definitely goes on next. Okay. My yeah. next highest thing after that would be Raging Bull, but that didn't make – or that did that make your list at all? No. No. Okay, right. Okay, so Raging Bull, what is Raging Bull for you? Uh, six. Okay, Hugo is my six. Uh-huh. Um, why don't we do this? Like, what's your what's your what's your attempt to try and sell to see what goes higher? That Raging Bull is the quintessential top three. What you would recommend for Scorsese over over Hugo? If you were to say what what movies are Scorsese movies, like you would recommend if your film yeah, school that's argument, I, your child, film school childlike, argument, <laughs> childlike wonder, childlike wonder is absolutely the argument for Hugo, but it's the guy who's literally done film courses. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, as the film course one you study, I think goes higher than the childlike wonder one. But yeah, I'm fine fair. with Hugo being on the list because again, I had it at like twelve, thirteen, like flirted with it, like honorable mm-hmm. mention kind of style. But yeah, 
All right, so Raging Bull makes it. Hugo makes it. What's your next highest? Uh, my last two that have been mentioned would be Cape Fear and Last Temptation. Cape Fear was 10, so. Cape Fear yeah. was 10. I had Killers of the Flower Moon at 9, so that'll go on. There you go. All right. Cool. So Killers of the Flower Moon makes it on the 11. All right, so this number one, number two. Uh, we'll do the same thing. So I like that. What? What if you had? To I, like, if I had, if I had to say, I would still make the film score argument. So I would put Goodfellas one. I'm fine with that because you okay. Because so you, you'd acquiesce. I, 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 I'm actually okay with that because again, I made I made the argument earlier that if you had to recommend like three movies to to say like for a starter pack for for Scorsese, you say Taxi Goodfellas Driver, Raging Bull, Goodfellas. Yes. Yeah, but I, it's, I, I think, it's just I, personal I, thing of like Wolf of Wall Street's fucking awesome, so it has to be in the top three. But like, you know what you I'm, know, I'm fine I, with I, that. I would make it. I would make the starter pack because I think you're right. Your starter pack idea of like mm -hmm. it, it's going to be Taxi Driver, it's going to be Raging Bull, it's going to be Goodfellas. I think if you're looking at Scorsese's modern filmmaking, make it that Walmart five dollar bin four pack and stick Wolf of Wall Street in there because I think no, I would. If I if I expanded it to four, I would say Wolf just for sheer entertainment value. Yes, and and for like to show that he can make a fun modern movie as well. Like that's not so like heavy on the themes and like you know not depressing to yeah. watch. <laughs> you know I would throw and, that. And in. There. It still yeah. has message because it's still talking about the, the capitalism right. and it's still talking about the excess of that life. And right. contrary to what a lot of people, if you've never seen it, like the, the like, and again, this is a this is mostly my generation and the way that we sort of look at things. A lot of people look at it as glorifying the life. It's very clearly not glorifying the life. No, it's not. The movie takes its its sweet time destroying everything that he earned and killing yeah. his you know his lifestyle and like. I understand the argument that people look at it like as a movie where it's like, yeah, but the guy still gets out of prison and he gets to go back and like beat, but that's what happened. You know, in real life. That's what, but in real life, rich assholes get, get off all the time. Politicians get off. All, all these people, you know, yeah, all these people off. that have money or have power, like skirt the system all the damn time. So that's even a Absolutely. commentary on these guys, how these rich assholes skirt the system constantly and are never held accountable Absolutely. for what they do. And again, you're, he's throwing you in this world of these skeevy people, but he's throwing you fucking head first all and diving into the into the deep end, you know, of what these guys do, and he's showing you exactly what they did. And the same thing with Jordan Belfort said, what they showed in the movie probably wasn't even ten percent of the crazy shit they did in real life, Hell which is hard to which is hard to believe. So it's even worse, much like the Raging Bull thing. God, I think I think Belfort said in real life he was like that the thing mm. that like was reduced the most was his drug use. I think he said oh, at yeah. one point he was on simultaneously twenty seven different drugs. The closer the you get to that is a little bit of that. The closer you get is Leo doing that monologue where he's walking through the house going, in the morning I take this for this and the Adderall for that and, and, so and the like, marijuana they, they left me out. Shit out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he was probably on every drug known to man at that point, for sure. And probably, <laughs> probably, like, he was, like, definitely huffing peyote and, like, shit that you wouldn't Oh, and probably doing, anymore. like, medical stuff that you could barely get a hold of, you know, medically, sure. like, you know, whatever. I'm sure anything you could possibly get a hold of, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, when you're but, no, I'm... Rich, no, I'm fine with the argument though about Goodfellas being like when you think of a Scorsese movie, Goodfellas is one of those movies that immediately. It's it kind of like the thing with Tarantino. Like you can have your your arguments about like your favorites. Like when we do, if we do a list, my personal might be like Django or Hateful. But like when you think of a Tarantino, what do you think of Pulp Fiction? Pulp. You know what I mean? It's it just is what it, yeah. it is. What it is, and I've always made that argument. So, and I'm fine with Scorsese being like, what do you think about Scorsese? Goodfellas. It just is what yep. it is. You know, it's fine. All so. right, so let's get to the actual countdown here. If I could have you do me the favor of shouting out the numbers, we'll jump into the top 11 Martin Scorsese films. Number 11. Killers of the Flower Moon. Number 10. Hugo. Number 9. Raging Bull. Number 8. Casino. Number 7. After Hours. Number 6. Taxi Driver. And the top five, number five. The Departed. Number four. Gangs of New York. Yay, number three. <laughs> the King of Comedy. <laughs> number two. The Wolf of Wall Street. Fucking A, and number one. <laughs> Goodfellas. There you go. Boom. Absolutely. Nice list. I like it. Uh, so 
before we close out the show, man, any honorable mentions to shout out? Anything that didn't get brought up? No, like I said, those three that were fighting those spot, that 11, number 11 spot, like I said, would be if I had to cut in like three that would fight for that spot. Uh, Shutter Island, which I think is a really good psychological thriller that I like. Um, and I just like the vibe of it and the atmosphere and, and you know, a lot of the character actors that in that movie, Elias Coteus and, you know, things like that. And uh, yeah. what's his name? John uh, or... Uh, what's his name lynch john Marshall, lynch what's his name john, <laughs> the three lynch. Name? john carol lynch yeah i was like the three name guy john carol lynch is great yeah all those people that pop up in that movie are great and i, I think it's got a good vibe to it uh hugo like again would make my honorables because I, I do really like the stuff about the film history in that movie and the ben kingsley stuff is great uh and i do think it has some great payoffs and then i'm a i'm a champion of bringing out the dead i, I really like bringing out the dead it has a really nice manic energy to it and uh again a great nick cage like crazy performance at the top which is always fun and again tons of great character actors peppered into that movie too like back and forth that are that are awesome so I'm, yeah i really like that I'm, movie i'm gonna echo bringing out the dead as well uh that one was it dude ving reigns in that film he's so good that was the best segment of the film that is so much fun yeah the little um, segments of that movie because like john goodman's in the first segment and it's, like ving reigns, and it's like ving reigns. Plays a fucking psychopath he's a and... psycho uh mark anthony is the drugged out guy trying to get the water the whole movie yeah. with the dreads he's I, great when the, the credit yeah. showed up i was like where was mark anthony in the would not with the dreads that. always he's begging so for the good. water he's so good yeah he's great and again patricia arquette who i love from true romance obviously uh is yeah. great no she's great um you know uh, uh, Her and Cliff. Cage have this really like weird chemistry, but it it's works. a really weird chemistry. But yeah, it works. Yeah, Curtis, it's a, yeah, so dealer. yeah, Bring Out the Dead is yeah one of those ones that I would say is definitely like underrated in his filmography. I it, wouldn't go quite as far to put it in like that top ten or anything like that, but I really it like was it. Definitely, it was definitely swinging for that eleven spot on on an, mm. on a day. You might even argue it for me over the Irishman. I definitely thought it, it it had it definitely had its moments i think by the time you reach the end i think it probably could be sped up a little bit but uh for most of that movie it's a wild ride uh as i said uh, raging bull i can respect it but i just it didn't enjoy it enough to like want to contend to put it in here uh i surprisingly enjoyed kundin uh mm. I, like it's really weird it like for his filmography it's really weird it's pretty straight yeah, yeah, yeah. the dalai lama but it's it's really unique for a scorsese film it might be the least a film has ever felt like a scorsese movie but that's I what i that's the vibes i got re-watching like the trailers and some of the stuff and I, so i didn't prioritize it even, you know for the show or whatever right. and i've always wanted to see it just to be a completionist you know and eventually get to it you know just as do, one do of you those... want the do you want the link i found do you want me to send it to you yeah i'll watch it eventually it's an ad youtube sure yeah uh, Oh, yeah, so it works. And then uh, the the other one I feel like if if you were to expand that uh, iconic Scorsese to a five is a uh, Mean Streets is the other one that people throw in there. I just don't think when you can when you compare the film to the rest of his filmography, I just don't think it holds up well enough. But that said, it's a foundational piece of his filmography, and you can see the beginnings of a young Scorsese really peeking out in there. You can see what he's going to build on later. And for De Niro as an actor, you can see what he'll build on later within it. I think it's it's fun to see these people in their early career, but it's not. No, I I watched uh, I rewatched Mean Streets um, uh, actually a few weeks ago because I just hadn't seen it in forever. And again, I have recontextualized it going on this '70s New York kick because it, it falls into that grouping as yes. well. Although yeah. you don't get to see as much of the city in that movie, which I was kind of disappointed. It kind of mostly takes place in that one bar and then the pool hall and like a couple of central locations hey man, budget um, budget. <laughs> but it is what it is it's one of his early ones but yeah i really like again the performances in that movie are great and yeah you could see everything that he would uh, expand on later so i do recommend seeing it as like a completionist like i do yeah, like the streets um but yeah i, I liked it but it, it again in those early ones it's like look if i get to boxcar birth at some point maybe i will but that, you know it's not a priority <laughs> yeah after yeah. hours and boxcar birth though were the two where i was like this you is made, a movie that he you, made you made the right decision going with after hours because even if you had texted me i would have been like oh 100 percent watch after hours, after hours. <laughs> like yeah oh 100 i'd already I seen that by that point that was one of yes. those where like once yes. i once i got most of the like yeah. non-mega long iconic stuff it's like after hours looks cool let's watch that it's like yes yes yeah. it is yeah. Uh, yeah. So Austin, thank you so much for being here with me, man. Uh, yeah, man. go ahead and pull it real quick. Where else can people find you? 
Oh, uh, no, mostly down below. I put it under my name here, the Movie Hero Network. Uh, Aaron's been on there occasionally here and there. We're trying to get him on more, but I know he's busy. Uh, but, yeah, we do all kinds of shows over there, man. We do t- uh, tier record fights, oh, tournament yeah. uh, tier record fights, tournament fights, uh, podcast league now, a podcast about movies with me and Jacob Barber, the Lonely Marks Wrestling Podcast. We do a new show called Recast where we recast old movies. Uh, oh, my God, what else do we do? Wheel of Movies. We do Seen and Heard Trivia. <laughs> uh, my God, it's everything. Uh, we've got a Seen and Heard uh, free-for-all that as of this recording, we will have done a few weeks ago, but you can see that our second annual uh, senior free for all, where we had over 30 competitors, we had some Shimodon competitors, uh, a really great finale. It was really, really fun. So, if you want an introduction to Seen and Heard, check that out. Um, but yeah, like we got stuff all the time over on the Movie Hero Network. So, go check us out over there. Obviously, I'm in Battleground whenever it pops up, uh, you know, pretty frequently. I did a lot of matches this year, so I'm, I'm, I'm in there a lot. I'm sure you're enjoying the rents. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm taking a little break, which is fine. I, I don't mind the break that we've had right now because, yeah, I feel like I was filming a match like once a month and I was like really like hitting, hitting them out there between that and the exhibitions. But uh, yeah, you can catch me over there. But uh, yeah, mainly over on the Movie Hero Network. We appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, guys. And, of course, here on TMG Entertainment, uh, more announcements to come about uh, the return of Battleground and kind of what's happening there. I sort of want to have everything in motion before I start saying stuff publicly because I'm I'm not the type of person that likes to announce things and then not follow through on it. That kills mm-hmm. me more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when I have it ready, you will hear about it. Uh, and then aside from that, because... Uh, so normally the way that this show will work is it'll be about a month straight of episodes and then we'll take a month off because I've had so much time in between to prepare for these episodes. I've added a couple on. So we're going to have about eight weeks, two months or so straight because I've had time to prepare extra lists and stuff. Uh, and just to run the topics down real quick, we're going to have uh, Disney animation will be the next one coming up uh, next week with Jacob Barber. Some of the other topics coming up in the future. Uh, we did record a Star Wars episode ages ago that I just never uploaded. There were some audio issues I kind of had to work on a little bit, but we got that fixed. That one features an actual personal friend of mine. Uh, He's also going to be joining me for a DCEU memoriam. We're just waiting until Aquaman comes out to fully cement that. Also, by the time this uploads, it'll be out, but recording-wise, we're waiting. Uh, I have uh, David Fincher with Jordan Owens coming up. I have Lakeith Stanfield films with Amaru Moses coming up, and then Matt Beer will be rejoining me uh, towards the end of January for Uh, original sci-fi films and musicals he'll be joining me for so we'll dive into those i will say if you ever want to dive into kubrick if you ever feel like it i'm your man oh at some point absolutely you have to because because i've seen i've seen them all i don't have any blind spots uh and i know it would literally be like you know top 11 because he literally has like 13 or something so it would be like like, yeah you know you would only be leaving off two if you made a list but i think I think he's one of those guys that people could have vastly different lists depending on their personal Probably, taste. depending on your taste with, and, with and how it... Yeah, so I've ranked him before. I've seen them all, so I could definitely do that if you ever wanted to do a deep dive on Kubrick. I'm, I'm your guy. Absolutely, that. that's like when that's like that's like a, a when like a September topic, like when it's just right. like dead fucking month. You're like, what do yeah. I? Oh, yeah, Kubrick could be great. Kubrick. Like, yeah, and, and I'm a big Tarantino guy. If you ever want to jump in on that for when his next movie, whenever that comes out, I'm always absolutely, down. that'll be. Um, you know, but that's the same thing where it's literally like that would literally be a top 10 because the others <laughs> that's what he's got uh if it well split i guess it, kill bill maybe if you split kill bill yeah you know you know or or we'll if you there. or if you wait till after and you include the new movie and let people see it you know whatever you know include just, grindhouse like yeah as a whole or just death proof <laughs> yeah well, death so. proof probably i don't know if i should count what rodrigo no it would just be death proof <laughs> yeah we'll just make we'll just make a, a weird assortment of like contingent things like what, what's that four rooms is that that like uh film that he directed yeah four but he only did the one segment of it yeah and, and yeah we'll the, just uh, throw in all the we'll throw in the weird connected shit right we'll throw in thanksgiving right that came from well, a film it, that he was now, a part. now if you include the three he wrote you could expand the list if you do the three scripted ones if you include I true romance the band Tide, if, no if you include true romance the legitimate credit ones true romance uh, know, yeah, from, yeah. Du- from dust till dawn and natural born killers you can expand the list and that yeah, would make it interesting because I love true romance, so that would be interesting. I've yeah. never seen it, but I've heard nothing but great things. It's so. awesome. <laughs> well, that'll yeah. all be for the future, guys. Again, next week's topic, I couldn't have a better person to join me for Disney Animation than Jacob Barber. Uh, we'll be going through that next week. 
But Austin, thank you for joining me again, guys. Thank you for sitting through and watching and check out any and all of the great films that Martin Scorsese did, quite literally, with the exception of probably New York, New York, which is literally not available publicly. You can't really go wrong with anything that you pick. Find something to your taste and mm -hmm. go enjoy this magnificent director's filmography. And of course, check out Killers of the Flower Moon before Oscar season comes around because it's going to be a contender. We'll see how it does. Till the next episode, take care, everybody. We'll see you later.